their laureate, their symposias, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to everybody. It's a great pleasure and an honor to welcome you all to the Holberg Symposium in honor of the 2022 Holberg laureate, Sheila Jasenov. I'm Kerstin Flutum and chair of the Holberg Board, which annually awards the Holberg Prize to an outstanding scholar in the humanities, social sciences, law, and theology. And we are particularly delighted that we can meet physically after two years of a pandemic close down. With a week now of celebrations and several academic events, and with the participation of outstanding scholars. We welcome all of you who are present here in the University Aula in Bergen, as well as everyone who is following the live stream from around the world. Now for the Holberg Symposium, the laureate is asked to propose a topic as well as to suggest the scholars with whom she would like to converse. And we look very much forward to taking part in the presentations and discussions during this year's symposium in honor of Sheila Jasanov, who has chosen the timely topic expertise and world making. And to present the laureate and the symposium speakers, I hereby give the floor to the academic director of the Holberg Prize, Bjorn Enge, Professor Bjorn Enge Bertelsen, who will be moderating the event. So, Bjorn, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chersti, and good morning to everyone. And I'm very pleased to take on the task of moderating this Holberg Symposium in honor of the 2022 Holberg Laureate, Sheila Jasanov. We're also extremely pleased to have four symposium speakers with us here in Bergen today in physical format, in the flesh, as it were. And we look forward to them sharing all their insights with us on the topic, as Chersti just announced, expertise and world making. The laureate and the symposium speakers, Silke Beck, Andrew Lang, Ben Hurlbut, and Patricia Williams, will all contribute to making sense of this topic. And we do really look forward to interventions from everyone. But before we delve into the symposium topic, please let me introduce the 2022 Holberg Laureate. Sheila Jasanov is Forsheimer Professor of Science and Technology Studies at the John F. Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. As one of the world's most influential uh, scholars in developing the field of Science and Technology Studies, STS, Jasanov has forged a unique interdisciplinary body of research at the intersection of the social sciences, humanities, arts for people and economy, and STEM disciplines. Jasanov has developed much of the conceptual repertoire for theorizing the political and policy relations of science and technology in contemporary societies. Her theoretical contributions to the political sociology of scientific governance are transformational, recognizing that scientific practices and knowledges, along with the policy and legal frameworks governing them, must be understood as culturally situated and socially constructed. This argument is, of course, captured in her collected essays, Science and Public Reason, which was published in 2012. A central insight in Jasanov's work is that science, technology, and modern society are co-produced. Her work is distinctive in analyzing how practices of expert knowledge production and background beliefs about science impact on the modes of argument and persuasion that count as good justification, not only for public policies and legal decisions, but also within scientific practice itself. Furthermore, her work on co-production, socio-technical imaginaries, and civic epistemologies has wide implications for the theory and practice of democracy in the 21st century. Among the most influential of her books have been Science at the Bar, Law, Science and Technology in America, which was published in 1995, and Designs on Nature, 
Science and Democracy in Europe and the United States, which was published in 2005. Her most recent works include The Ethics of Invention, from 2016, Dreamscapes of Modernity, Sociotechnical Imaginaries and the Fabrication of Power, which was published with Sang Hyun Kim from 2016, and Can Science Make Sense of Life? Indeed a Good Question, from 2019. The specific issues her work has addressed include genetic engineering, stem cell treatment, reproductive technologies, climate change, and chemical production. Jasanov spent her childhood in India, has taught at institutions around the world in various capacities, and has been outstandingly influential in both capacity building and nurturing new generations of scholars, including founding and directing the Kennedy School's program on STS at Harvard University. She also founded in 2002 and still chairs the Science and Demo Democracy Network. This is a global community of STS scholars dedicated to improving scholarly understanding of the relationship between science, technology, law and political power. Through sharing her work in both academic and popular forums, Jasanov is a significant public intellectual, offering timely comments on topics of public concern, such as fake news and climate change. Crucially, Jasanov combines a high level of conceptual creativity with empirical rigor and accessible writing. Indeed, Jasanov is read not only by humanities and social science scholars, but also by natural and medical scientists and policymakers who work tr being truly wide ranging and cross disciplinary. By any standard, Professor Jasanov's achievements are truly remarkable. It is therefore a great privilege for us to be able to organize this symposium in her honor today. I now give the floor to Professor Sheila Jasanov, who will introduce the topic for the Holberg Symposium entitled Expertise and World Making. Welcome, Sheila. Thank you, Björn, for that generous introduction, and thank you to the Holberg board and the committee and all of the other people who have made it possible for the symposium participants and myself to be here this morning. Um, so uh, there is always a, an artificiality to hearing one's activities singled out in the way that um, the introducer has to do. In fact, the ideas, especially when they are interdisciplinary and not conforming to some well laid down lines of work and paradigms, uh, that work could not evolve without conversation across communities and across fields. Uh, the four speakers who will be um, introduced individually today represent in the collective a kind of um, instantiation of the ways in which new learning and new thinking evolves um, over time. And I want to say something about the topic, but also about what I myself have learned from each and every one of them uh, over now years and decades of, of conversation. So it is very much a dialogic experience, and I hope that in the hours that we have this morning, we'll be able to convey to you some of that sense of dialogue. It is not they honor me with their presence, and that is um, a very important thing to keep in mind. Um, so expertise in world making. World making is familiar to philosophers as you know, part of um, the ways in which we understand reality and the ways in which we make sense of the kinds of experiences we live in and live with. Expertise is not normally seen as in the business of creating worlds, rather it is seen as being in the business of mapping and explaining and describing worlds that already are there. Um, I fell into the topic of thinking about expertise in a way uh, somewhat by, by accident. I had been working on regulatory politics across countries and it led me to wonder uh, 
why it was that a, a sort of central observation, um, first of all, had not been noticed before, and secondly, how to make sense of it. The observation was that, of course, scientific literature is universal. Things get published, people peer review the, 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 those things. Uh, there are journals that are better or worse. Some have more authority than others. Everybody knows what the, the sort of hierarchy is in the sciences and what is an authoritative piece of work relatively compared with something else. So you would expect that after all that sort of rigorous communion with nature and then rigorous communion inside of your own community to make sure that you were doing the methods right and so on and so forth. The results that would come out would be universally intelligible, understandable and portable and therefore they would lead to the same sorts of results in terms of public policy. So the sort of shock of the new in terms of my own research was discovering in the very first project that I did that this was not borne out by the actual facts, that people looked at the same science, but when they tried to decide what to do with the knowledge in terms of choices of what to regulate, to what extent and how, they came to different conclusions. So from that project, I became interested in what happens in that sort of alchemical space where scientists offer advice to policymakers. And I ended up writing a book about that. I think one that Bjorn, you didn't mention the title of it was called The Fifth Branch. Um, one sort of slightly humorous thing is that the fifth branch was such a sort of insider name that I gave to it that everybody misunderstood it. I called it the fifth branch because in America, there are the three traditional branches of government, the, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial, and then the regulatory agencies, the agencies of the, of the executive branch, have often been referred to as a fourth branch. And so my contribution was to show the phalanx of expertise behind this fourth branch, and I called it the fifth branch. So for many years, people kept calling it the fourth estate book. Um, but, you know, one has to sort of live and learn about not being too arcane in one's choices of book titles. Um, this is why Can Science Make Sense, of, Make Sense of Life is my most recent title. Anybody can kind of get what that means. Um, in, in any case, in doing the research on the fifth branch, I discovered that the experts who were advising government to some degree were occupying a world that was very different from science in the universities, and that this was a sort of politicized territory. Uh, a story that many people may not be aware of is that when I was appointed at Harvard in 1998, this was at the tail end of something that has gone down in history as the science wars. So in the mid-1990s, uh, scientists became a bit excited, hot under the collar, uh, about the fact that their work was being deconstructed, which they took to be an assault on the truth, because they were the custodians of truth, and it was their expertise that established what was right. And so anybody who presumed to study how that was actually done was, in some sense, attacking them. And I had blissfully escaped all of this, partly because my work is very empirically grounded. Scientists actually had no trouble. I mean, Bjorn, as you mentioned earlier, um, scientists who advise government have always read my work and found it quite useful because it's describing their experience in a, in a certain way. But it turned out that, that during those Harvard appointment proceedings, the people who were on the north side of the river, which is where the basic sciences hang out, had a very much more hostile reaction to my book than the people who hang out on the south side of the river, where you have medicine, public health, and other messy enterprises. So the scientists working in the messy worlds thought that I had done a very good job of explaining the ways in which they resolve their uncertainties, bring their own value systems to bear in interpreting what is going on, the people on the north side of the river were extremely ideologically attached to the view that truth is simply truth and there is no such thing as 
value-conditioned ways of looking at the world. So in a sense, from my own experience, having my work read very differently by different communities of scientists, I became intensely aware of the politics of scientific expertise when it meets up against the decision makers and the power makers of the world. And at that point, of course, fortunately for myself, I discovered that a number of other very distinguished people were also thinking about some of these topics. And so I'll say a little bit about the particular constellation of four speakers that you will see, because they come from different walks of life that intersect with mine. So two are from the other side of the Atlantic, uh, Ben Herbert and Pat Williams. Uh, one is from every side of every ocean that I can imagine, which is Andrew Lang, who's been in England and Scotland, but also Australia. And so he is uh, Mr. Anglophone world, but not American. Uh, so that makes for a different perspective altogether. And then my dear friend Silke Beck, who is German and brings, again, a different set of perspectives to bear on the ways in which expertise relates to the kinds of decision-making worlds that uh, we are interested in if we're studying democracy and studying the exercise of power. Then they reflect different disciplinary orientations, and that also, I think, contributes to the richness of what you will be hearing. So both Pat Williams and Andrew Lang are distinguished legal scholars, and law is my own basic training. Unlike the two of them, I have not carried out my work in the law school. So it has actually been very instructive to keep on having conversations with lawyers who continue to perform the field as it was meant to be performed instead of like the renegade person that I am trying to do legal studies without being in a law school. Zilke Beck is trained in political science but also interdisciplinary studies and Ben Herbert is a refugee to STS, my kind of STS, but from history of science. Um, so in, in that sense, the sort of perspectives they bring to the role of expertise in power or in relation to power is also something that I think you might uh, listen for and uh, be informed by. And then uh, they also reflect attention to different focal points or different theaters where expertise comes into contact with world making. So both Pat Williams and Ben Herbert have done a lot of work in relation to the biological sciences, but also now branching out to information science and technology and the digital world um, through uh, work in Ben's case, for instance, on transhumanism. Um, Andrew Lang has worked particularly on economics and markets. And this is a place of world making that, is, that has historically been less well understood in STS. STS went after the hard sciences, the natural sciences first, including the life sciences and technologies. And only in relatively recent years has, has STS concerned itself with markets. So having that ingredient in the mix, how trade and markets reflect another theater that's extremely important for world making. That is another thing that I think you will get out of today's conversation. And then Zilke, who is um, situated at the moment somewhere between Leipzig and Munich, um, is, um, has been for a long time interested in questions of sustainability and global environmental problems. And so her work, again, intersects with mine on that level, but it also brings in questions of global world making, just as Andrews also does. And therefore, you will see um, the ways in which expertise and very important current ideas of climate management and sustainability, for instance, uh, are playing out together. So that is just a tiny uh, taster uh, of the cornucopia of riches that you're about to listen to. And I myself am thrilled and delighted to be able to sit back and listen to four of my dearest friends and colleagues um, talk about, I hope, mainly their work and not my work. So with that, let me um, hand it back to Bjorn. <laughs>
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Jasanov, for that uh, introduction. Uh, we now move to the symposium speakers, uh, as Sheila looks forward to and we all look forward to, and thereafter we'll have a discussion on stage and thereafter also a Q&A session. Each speaker has been asked to prepare a 20-minute presentation, and the first speaker this morning is Professor Silke Beck, She's Professor of Sociology of Science at the Technical University of Munich, or thereabouts, as we just learned. Professor Beck is an internationally, internationally recognized expert in the field of global environmental expertise, as well as evidence-based policymaking on climate change, biodiversity and transformation towards sustainability. After an academic year in the Global Environmental Assessment Project at Harvard University, Beck has worked at the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research in Leipzig, one of Europe's leading research centers on inter interdisciplinary environmental research development. More recently, Beck is the principal investigator of the project Governance of Socio-Technical Transformation as part of the Belmont North Face research program entitled Transformation Towards Sustainability. Her future research will address the responsible governance of negative emission technologies and their societal risks and opportunities. The overarching goal of Professor Beck's research is to combine STS research on science in society with real-world engagements in advisory bodies and societal co-production in an interactive and reflexive way. She was also a founding member of the UFZ Science Policy Expert Group, which has performed a leading role in providing research in support of the design and evaluation of real-world interfaces in the field of global environmental politics. This group has provided direct input into negotiation processes on the reform of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPC, on the establishment of the, of the National Biodiversity Network, and finally, the setup of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. Beck serves as a lead expert for the IPBES Assessment of Transformative Change. By combining scientific analysis and practical engagement, her group seeks to generate concepts, criteria and guidelines to evaluate and explore design options and procedures in fields such as climate services and, transform and transformative change. Sorry. The title of our presentation today is Constitutional, Constitutional Moments for Rediscovering Climate? Question mark. Professor Beck, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the kind invitation and for the opportunity to join you here. Dear Laureate, dear Sheila, dear committee, dear audience, it's a great pleasure to um, invite you to journey to discover the world, the emerging world of global environment politics through and with Sheila's lenses. Um, Okay, um, so as I've mentioned many times before, Sheila has become a pioneer in discovering the uncharted territory of global environmental politics. And as you see in the picture, um, she was starting with a lot of energy and this energy is taking over to different scholarships. And I will shortly, um, I can't see the screen. Um, can you help me? There is no screen. <laughs> 
I'm sorry for uh, but but there's no There's a black screen, can you? And can you also where the text is? So you have time to look at the wonderful pictures <laughs> and the emerging world of the United Nations environmental program. As long as we are waiting that the technique is working, so I'm sorry. <laughs> this is the only thing I couldn't take care of. <laughs> can also plug in my computer. Here we are. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And how to? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you very much. So I can continue. Um, as a pioneer in her field, Sheila has especially concerned with the emergence of a global arena. And interestingly, Sheila argues, argues that we are all participant observers in a process of global constitution making. So let us take her invitation and her idea seriously and follow her uh, through her journey discovering the emergent landscape of global environmental politics. And as a pioneer, Sheila has also to make and build up her own tools, concepts, in order to make sense of these novel, uncharted, emerging worlds. And when I started my PhD in 1994 on the IPCC, so there was almost nothing how to understand the new emerging panels and knowledge-making practices. And Sheila's work has quite um, useful for my own work in order to make sense um, what was happening at the global level. So, um, as you may know, environmental issues such as climate change um, are very prominent in Sheila's work. And an ongoing research interest is the role of images and visual text and visualization in global governance. And sustainability, as you may all know, has been seen as an icon standing for the um, emerging awareness that we are all sitting in the same boat, meaning thinking globally, and also the fragility of the planet. So, but Sheila is not only interested in making us aware of sense making, but she always pushed that to understand global environmental governance also as a space of 
constitution making. Um, so, um, in order to understand where we stand now, we have also to rethink where and how particular imaginaries and ideas come from. So, let me shortly introduce into the world of global environmental expertise. The use of climate models have been very important to set up climate change and bring politics into being. And the use of climate models as a particular way of knowing um, has been subject to critical observation in science and technology studies for this decades. And STS scholars have shown that current modeling practices came from or emerged in the Cold War culture, and um, they have been embedded and inscribed by particular military and um, forecast technologies. Um, Richard Ashley calls the emerging role of, of models in climate politics um, the eye of power in order to highlight or put our attention to the world-making role of expertise. And since that time, STS scholarship following Sheila has tried to understand um, how climate models have set the stage and enabled particular ways of framing and governing climate change. Um, when it comes to climate change, one could override this with one size fits all. So climate change was framed as a global, single, and all passing whisk. Therefore, hundreds and thousands of climate scientists um, upscaled information from local contexts, such as snow or heat or things like that, and decoupled it from systems of experiences where gases come from and how they have been emerged. So, um, climate science and the IPCC in particular were also able to translate all this information into a single measure of risks, of risk, and this single measure of risk was very important, this kind of um, one-size-fits-all framing in order to particular ways in um, how to govern climate change. So um, this um, one gas as one indicator was also enabling particular forms of governing, such as markets and last but not least, lately, technologies. And, um, and very important, the Intergovernmental um, Panel on Climate Change was very um, helpful in order to translate these framings, these messages, into policy making, and the IPCC was also able to speak in the name of international science and has become very authoritative when it comes to climate change. And in 2007, he, um, it was awarded with the Peace Nobel Prize. So where do we stand in climate policy now? On the one side, we have excellent international science. We have the IPCC as a Nobel Prize um, already. And last but not least, we have hundreds and thousands of science contributing to the IPCC. But on the other side, all the knowledge that is produced is not really relevant and not usable for decision making on the ground. So we have this famous gap between um, knowledge and action. And when it comes to implementation, on the one side, we have long-term international negotiations counting as success story. But on the other side, we have this famous um, gap between talk and action. And even if the Paris Agreement counts as a big breakthrough in international diplomacy, on the other side, the targets adopted at Paris, they are not sufficient to meet climate targets. So, and this ambition gap is on top of the implementation gap. In, and in other words, at the end of the day, and that's the sad part of the story, emissions are still rising in a significant way. So, um, on the one side, we can see that um, 
markets and technologies are seen as the most efficient solution to these problems. So they count as whatever technological advances, they seem to enable win-win situations, and they come in if um, changes of routine behavior or practices or institutional transformations are hard to implement. On the other side, we can also see in terms of the implementation and ambition gap and um, the insufficiency, the failure of these approaches based on this one-size-fits-all framing. So um, problems or uh, solutions developed on the, this space often address symptoms rather than causes of climate change and they fail to deal with problems of equity and social justice and they don't address questions of historical and future responsibility for climate change and current unequal pattern of per capita um, consumption in an adequate way. So Sheila um, puts our attention to questions why. Why are substantial um, segments of national and international publics not convinced um, for the need of urgent action and why is knowledge making not more coherent or usable with society demands for just policies? So um, one answer to the question is let's take a look at science and if you ask the question what is about the production of climate science that inhibits justice the answer seems to be quite easy it's the linear model of expertise so um, it's the assumption or belief that more and better science will trigger policy action or transformative um, action and that um, experts are seen as global arbiters or referees in the global playing field so science counts as the only authority to decide these problems and last but not least it's also attached to the belief that science determines policy making if we take a look at the framing so we can also see that um, this one dimensional framing is not part of the solution, but also part of the problem. Similar to the linear model of science linking policy making, it also is based on a linear one-dimensional projection of the future. And a lot of um, projections of climate future, they are based on the techno-optimistic assumption that there is always a solution, technological solution, if the price is enough. In other words, they are based on the phase of economic growth with carbon price as the main driver. So in other words, um, why don't we transform? So the answer is easy, because um, these projections tell us that necessary emission reductions can be achieved through incremental change. In other words, these projections of the future also contribute to stabilize rather than transform path dependencies and lock-ins. So, um, trained as STS scholars, we are also used to take a look at the underlying assumption and we can say that um, efforts to transform or to um, move to a just policy are often um, based on efforts to imagine um, climate change in a very one-dimensional and one-directional way. In the climate world, technological solutions such as carbon removal technologies and markets are seen as necessary and inevitable to achieve the Paris Agreement. The message here is there is no alternative and we don't have any time to discuss now. And models used by the IPCC also um, contribute to reproduce and stabilize the dominant paradigm of progress and almost uncritical purpose of economic growth. And this linear framing also contributes to limit our corridor of future climate 
jurisdiction and narrow it down to technical solution and, and technological solutionism. So I'm um, based on where we came from. The question is, what are future questions that could um, direct the uh, discussion in a constructive way? So can we also see the climate crisis as an opportunity um, to um, as an opportunity to rethink climate change? Can we see it as a window of opportunity for um, STS or interpretative research to look beyond linear and dominant framings of climate change? And Sheila put our attention or make us think that climate futures have to be grounded in questions about justice and not just of the totality of goods. And she puts our attention to often neglected or ignored question of climate justice and not as an end of, of end of pipe thing that we can talk about technologies, we can talk about markets, and then we can think about justice, but take justice as a sine qua non for developing climate solutions. And last but not least, also based on her own history, um, she also pushes us to take into account alternative visions beyond Western, Northern models of climate change. So um, the question then is, who is speaking for the future of climate? And we have to take a look at who is sitting at the table, but, but it's not simply about participation and bringing more indigenous people to the table, table, but it's all about the need to think structurally about the relationship between climate change and systemic power imbalances within and between regions and generations. So when it comes to climate change, we have three layers of the problem. Regional distribution of causes of climate change, which are related to questions of historical and future responsibility. We have also the question or the questions related to regional distributions of impacts, vulnerability and resilience. And last but not least, we can also expect that the technical solutions to fix the climate, they may also have um, implications for justice when carbon markets are set up and uh, deployed large scale. So um, why does constitutionalism matter when it comes to rethinking global climate science? So we have to take a look beyond the UN machinery um, and discover alternative legal institutions at different scales. And it's not simply about making solutions more efficient or is regimes more robust. Um, Sheila's perspective also forces us to rethink questions of control and agency in governance, to understand broader questions of scale, jurisdiction and representation, but also asking new questions about um, trust and accountability in national and international debates and together with societal actors and moving um, she raises the question how we can reconstitutionalize contemporary politics. So I will skip this slide and end up here. So Sheila, thank you very much for inviting us, providing us guidance um, by your journey, but also informing our journey through the world. Um, I've taken pictures from your I guess last trip to India, Bangalore, before the, before the pandemic started. And with these pictures, um, I want to say thank you, but also I wish you a lot of opportunities to travel again, to meet places, but also meet people, make friends, and in this way to build up communities and enlarge or strengthen our um, thought collective. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, uh, Professor Beck, and uh, apologies again for the technical hiccup we had. The next speaker in the symposium is Professor Andrew Lang. Professor Andrew Lang is Professor of Law at the University of Edinburgh Law School, where he has held the Chair in International and Global Governance since 2017. He has previously held appointments at the London School of Economics from 2006 to 2017 and at Cambridge University from 2004 to 2006. He has also held visiting positions at Harvard Law School, the Institute of International Economic Law at Georgetown University Law Center, the University of Michigan and the University of Sydney. Lang sits on the editorial committee of the Modern Law Review, the editorial boards of the London Review of International Law, the Journal of International Economic Law, and the International and Comparative Law Quarterly. Now, Professor Lang's research focuses, uh, focuses on global knowledge regimes, the politics of expertise in global regulatory governance, and the knowledge practices of international institutions. He has published on scientific uncertainty in global food safety governance, as well as the juridico-epistemic construction of market distortions in the context of US-China trade. Professor Lang has also published on competing conceptions of equivalence and non-equivalence in international financial services regulation and the performativity of expert knowledges in the context of measurement of governance quality by global institutions. His current research interests focus on governance innovations emerging at the intersection of big data and agile regulation and their significance for architectures of global regulatory governance. The title of his presentation today is Expertise, Ignorance and International Governance, a very timely topic, I think. Professor Lang, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction and good morning to all. It is truly an honor and a great pleasure to take part in this symposium in honor of Professor Sheila Jasanoff today, even in the context of a career as glittering and full of landmarks as hers, this must be one of the great highlights. We're of course already accustomed to putting the name of Jasanoff alongside Habermas, Kristeva, Dworkin, Jameson, Hacking, Latour, Nussbaum, but it feels especially appropriate to do so now as a Holberg laureate in a very long line of special previous recipients of the award. In preparing these remarks today, I have spent a very happy time returning to two thick A4 notebooks which I filled over a decade ago with handwritten notes on Sheila's work at a time when I decided to set aside some months to read everything of hers that I could get my hands on. It has been a bit like a refreshing dive into a pool on a hot summer's day. I've rediscovered so many insights, propositions, approaches on which I have drawn in the intervening years, both directly and indirectly, explicitly and implicitly. And my own notes to myself set out in the margins alongside the summaries of Sheila's texts themselves and interspersed amongst them are, I think, as clear a material testament as any I can give of the excitement that her work has provoked in generations of scholars and the influence that she has had. My original entry point to Sheila's scholarship was her work on global knowledge regimes and global knowledge making, and that's going to be my theme for today. But for reasons that will become clear soon, I want to start by recalling some of her earlier work, which Sheila referred to, in fact, in her opening remarks, on regulatory science in the context of the US administrative practices in the late 20th century. And I have in mind here her books, The Fifth Branch, Science at the Bar, but also Science and Public Reason from 2013, but that's a collection of essays from the previous 20 years. Also some of texts which I think of as quite important constitutional moments in governing science and technology, 
Practices of Objectivity and Regulatory Science, both 2011 publications. So within this body of work, the main object of investigation is a major reorganization of the role of science, scientists, and scientific practices in the US administrative state, which occurred over the last two decades of the 20th century. And Sheila's work provides as good and subtle a guide to the history of that transformation as you will find anywhere, so any attempt now to state it succinctly will do some violence to it. But in constitutional moments, Sheila draws a series of distinctions between the state science configurations characteristic of the US state between roughly 1980 and 2000, and those um, uh, sorry, between 1940 and 1980, and those of the following two decades. So during the first period, the specialized technical agencies of the New Deal state were criticized for their lack of transparency. There was a suspicion of bureaucratic knowledge and the susceptibility of bureau bureaucracy to capture. And as a result, new initiatives emerged for broader public participation, community con consultation, even as the scope of state action was expanded. This was accompanied by liberalized rules of access, sympath sympathetic judicial review. In the second period, which is the main object of inquiry from 1980 to 2000, this period heralded a deep dissatisfaction with that administrative state, a cutting back of its functions and scope and therefore also of public participation, a transfer of responsibility for science and innovation to the market, a parallel reassertion of the authority of science and scientific expertise over both bureaucratic expertise and public knowledges. The disciplining of regulatory decision making through formalized practices of risk assessment, cost benefit analysis, and so on. And the privatization of value debates through increasing delegation to professional ethicists. Importantly, that transformation was enabled and operationalized through the combination of two quite distinct critiques of the post war welfare state and its associated knowledge practices. The first, was a critique of regulatory capture. And in this story, the sprawling architecture of the administrative state had emerged out of both a dynamic of industry capture and a risk-averse bureaucratic culture. And here, the turn to science, and more generally, the formalized practices of risk assessment, cost-benefit analysis, and so on, um, was an enactment of the desire to discipline bureaucracy through science. The second critique is in some ways the inverse. It is a critique of the technocratic hubris of the welfare state, its interventionist economic policies, its confident ability to predict the outcomes of its interventions. And in this critique, its bureaucratic practice, which is refigured as the repository of techno-scientific hubris. And that is disciplined by the market, understood in Hayekian terms, as a distributed calculating device. So clearly those two critiques are in tension in some ways, but at that historical moment they were pragmatically combined to bring into being the late 20th century regulatory state and its distinct practices of regulatory science. And it was Sheila's work which made clear that this change in administrative practices had constitutional significance and through a series of detailed studies of the regulation of gene modification, clean air, food safety, the EPA, the FDA, many more. Sheila has traced the distinctive practices of objectivity of regulatory science in that space, its particular standards of serviceable truth, and so on. And three, contribution, three contributions of Sheila's work in particular strike me as worthy of note now, in part because they've been so influential in the field in which I work, but also because I think this potential remains still un fully realized, not fully realized. So first, Schiller's work provides a distinctively constructivist explanation of regulatory science and of how particular regulatory, uh, scientific representations of the world acquire a hold on people's beliefs. So in a paper entitled Image and Imagination, she helpfully contrasts her approach with those of others. Latour, who emphasizes the mundane craftsmanship of knowledge production, 
the techniques of science in, in his account of how truths are made to hold. And contrast also with Anderson, who focuses on the role of capital in providing conduits for the mobility of collective representations. For Sheila, scientific representations of the world can be made to hold when they resonate with shared cultures of interpretation. Images become persuasive when they, when they link up with shared ways of looking which have been prepared and entrenched in advance. And so this constructivist emphasis led Sheila to develop the productive notion of the civic epistemology. That is to say, shared understandings, usually the container is the nation state, about what, makes some, about what makes some sorts of knowledge seem credible, shared expectations about how to produce authoritative knowledge, shared styles of public knowledge making, methods of ensuring accountability, practices of public demonstration, preferred registers of objectivity, and so on. And this, and I think Sheila's right about this, the claim is that it's, that, it's those, that constructivist emphasis, that imagination, um, that's what requires investigation if we are to understand more fully the constitutional dynamics of regulatory science. So that's the first intervention. The second one, I think Sheila has helped us to understand that these transformations of the administrative state also created a newly privileged position for science and technology and the discourses associated with them, investing them with a privileged position in the social constitution of collective imaginaries of the future. So if it's now relatively common to speak of those decades, 1980 to 2000, as a desacralization of politics, that is to say an erosion of the ability of political institutions to speak on behalf of and cred cred credibly constitute a social, it also, we now know, reinforced the sacralization of science and technology as repositories of that collective normativity, collective normativity and collective aspiration. This, I think, is a crucial insight. And third, although there's really no hint, I don't think, in Sheila's work of nostalgia for a post-war administrative state, nevertheless, she has brought a series of powerful critiques of that late 20th century regulatory state to bear, focusing especially on its anti-democratic tendencies, and I think Ben is going to speak more to that. So ever present in the background of all of this work is a series of cat catastrophic technocratic disasters, Bhopal, AIDS, crisis, 9-11, challenger disaster, Chernobyl, the ozone layer, and so on. And the distinctive responses of STS scholarship to such events has been to excavate the normative presuppositions of scientific practice and subject them to public reason. The key for Sheila is, is, as I read her work, is to build practices of public reason which are attuned to the production of socially robust knowledge, to integrate technologies of humility into the practice of regulatory science, to confront the normative implications of our lack of public foresight, including such techniques as frame analysis, investigation of the social, social foundations of vulnerability, the distributional effects of risk regulation, also the mechanisms for regulatory deep learning, and so on. Okay, all of that is by way of setting the stage for a turn in STS scholarship to global knowledge regimes and the question of knowledge and expertise in global governance, of course, is not a new one, but I think the field of STS has posed it in new ways, with a different conceptual apparatus and pursuing new lines of inquiry, which, in my view, were deeply shaped by precisely what I've just described, by decades of STS scholarship on the regulatory state, particularly in the United States and elsewhere. And I think it's fair to say that Sheila has been as influential as anyone in shaping the ways in, uh, in, in shaping the ways in which global practices of knowledge production have been investigated and how that investigation has proceeded over the last 15, 20 years in international legal scholarship. So part of the story here is that the building out of that late 20th century regulatory state in a variety of different places around the world, in a variety of different heterodox forms, in the context of global economic integration has generated regulatory clashes between regulatory cultures, between different approaches to risk, between different civic epistemologies. 
and institutions of global regulatory governance have emerged in part to address those frictions. And, in, and part of what we're talking about here are international standard setting bodies tasked with developing harmonized international regulatory standards through processes which rely on, which rely heavily on scientific and other forms of technical expertise. So think of the ISO, think of the Codex, think of the IPPC, um, think of the World Organization for Animal Health and so on. And some of the best STS scholarship on these global institutions has focused on asking a set of questions which reflect earlier work on the regulatory state at the domestic level. How is epistemic credibility produced in these international knowledge institutions? What are the specific practices of objectivity characteristic of these institutions? What knowledge underpins global regulatory governance and what are its centers of calculation? What social forms enable frictionless transfer of knowledge around the globe? How do we bring technologies of humility to bear at the international level? And I would just mention Sheila's and others work on transatlantic conflicts around biotech regulation in the WTO and Codex as exemplary of this sort of scholarship that I have in mind, though there are many other illustrations. So what have we learned from those investigations? Well, it turns out, in my view, that the knowledge practices which emerge in these international spaces around market regulation are distinctive in important ways as compared to their domestic equivalents. For example, for the most part, there's no civic epistemology characteristic of these international spaces, at least not in the thick sense in which that term is used um, in Sheila's work. Nor, it seems, has it proved possible to build a durable um, one, given the relatively thin institutional framework characteristic of contemporary global governance. There are simply too few opportunities and spaces for engaging in processes of public reason to produce minimally robust knowledge on a global scale in contested regulatory contexts. What technical regulatory knowledge is produced is typically generic, fragile, vulnerable to repeated crises of confidence, even more so than in a national context. In addition, the structural context in which expert reg regulatory standard setting at the international level takes place, specifically the promotion of economic integration and the construction of rules of competition for uh, neutral competitive rules for global markets, tends to produce a fairly pervasive reflexivity amongst the relevant, relevant expert communities about the limitations of its claims to authoritative truth. As Kennedy has most sensitively described, it seems instinctively understood with these communities that, that national regulatory and epistemic cultures not only reflect normative commitments, and they do, of course, but also on the output side, deeply shape the competitive dynamics of the global economy. They are a source of advantage and disadvantage for firms competing for position in global markets. And that inescapable fact is never far from the surface in these institutions. And to the extent that that's true, regulatory science at the global level often appears as much a site of open negotiation as any political decision-making space. The same point can be put in another way. I said earlier that the 20th century regulatory state was produced at the intersection of two conflicting critiques of, of, of the administrative state. One seeking to discipline bureaucracy by reference to science, the other by reference to the market. And in the international spaces constituted around projects of economic integration, it's proved much harder to ignore the very different directions in which those two critiques push one crudely in favor of more and better science, and the other deeply skeptical of all claims to centralized authoritative knowledge. And different ways of accommodating those two critiques have had to be found. And I think the unique ways of putting those two things together give global knowledge making a distinctive hue. There are, yes, attempts to produce authoritative truth, but more often, one sees other ways of settling epistemic controversies, attempts to avoid assertions of truth, to avoid unsettled questions, ways of asserting knowledge claims which keep them provisional, 
constant professions of uncertainty and ignorance which turn out to be as politically generative as claims to epistemic authority. And what's often produced as a result of all of this then are thin meta-rationalities of knowledge which have the capacity to stretch when needed to encompass different epistemic cultures, different regulatory cultures as circumstances demand, but which at the same time can also credibly support aspirations, global aspirations for an imagined future of regulatory convergence and integration. And I think it remains an important and interesting question posed very precisely and productively in Sheila's work, exactly what technologies of humility might effectively be brought to bear on those distinctive kinds of knowledge practices. In the final 10 minutes or so remaining to me, I want to change the focus somewhat and zero in on something a little more specific. I noted above, I noted earlier, the hugely important claim of STS scholarship that collectively produced imaginaries of techno-scientific futures, socio-technical imaginaries, can have genuinely constitutional significance to the extent that they constitute and purport to express collective normative visions and political commitments, and implicitly or explicitly express very specific visions of what governance means and how it should be carried out. That's a very important claim and that's what I want to focus on now. It's a different claim from the ones that I've, that I've just been dealing with. And those sorts of imaginaries are certainly being produced and disseminated across a variety of global knowledge spaces. These are a key element of global knowledge making. And so taking my lead from Schiller's work but from others uh, in this panel, uh, it's clear to me that much more work can and should be done to investigate precisely how that's happening and with what effects. And so in that spirit, let me just offer you a vignette for reflection. So I want to focus in on an organization called the United Nations Global Pulse, UNGP, which was established in 2009 as an initiative of the Executive Office of the UN Secretary General. And the mission of UNGP is, in very generic terms, to harness the potential of big data for the field of development and humanitarianism. And it has headquarters in New York, but it has pulse labs, experimental policy labs, in Jakarta, Kampala, and Helsinki. In December 2010, in the second year of its existence, UN Global Pulse uh, convened something called Pulse, Lam, Pulse, Lam, Pulse Camp 1.0, which was a three-day event to facilitate brainstorming about a tech platform it was building. And in preparation for that, it, the executive director of this organization disseminated a think piece to participants in which he sets out an imagined future scenario in which this tech platform might be working. And so, I, and this document is interesting to me, not because it's just one among myriad documents, but nevertheless it's interesting because it provides a very particular image of what it should mean to govern adequately and effectively in the near future. And that's in the spirit in which I, I report it to you. So the piece asks us to imagine a global crisis involving increasing fuel prices, decreasing food, food, uh, food supply, massive job losses in some unspecified developing country. And then it asks, well, what are the responses that we know vulnerable people might take to such a crisis? They might take on extra work, cut back on non-essential expenses, switch to less costly food and so on. Or worse, they might start to pull their children out of school to work, cut back on the quality and number of meals, forego medical care. And some of those choices will generate long-term harm. And in this world, the, go the key governance challenge is to act fast to prevent those choices, to prevent that long-term harm. And this think piece says, leaders understand this. What's stopping them is inadequate access to timely information about the choices that people are making in real time. And if you had that information in real time, you could, go, you could make those rapid interventions. So the idea, the, the idea which generates this, this think piece is to build a technology platform for aggregating new and diverse data sources to respond to that demand for, for um, in time for, for timely um, information. How would it work? Well, here again, I'm just quoting from the, this interesting think piece. So, 
several months after the onset of a, of a complex global crisis, Pulse Lab personnel note some worrying data points from UN food security monitoring indicators around average rainfall, oil price fluctuations, and so on. Then the Global Pulse software automatically, this is all an imagined future, automatically picks up a more worrisome pattern uh, through real-time monitoring at the national level. Sharp rise in food prices, increased inquiries about fertilizer prices on social media uh, and mobile channels, a rise in the use of prepaid mobile calls, and so on. This information is automatically through the software shared with the Global Pulse team that works through their networks uh, to disseminate it. Pulse Lab staff broadcast text messages to radio station operators in, the spa, in, that, in, this, in this developing country to inform them of their concerns, sensitize them to listen for f calls on feedback radio and messages from their audience, which could indicate that this is getting worse. The national government sends in a team to the region to perform a ration, r rapid household level impact assessment, which confirms the hypothesis. Um, Pulse Lab then mobilizes support infrastructure using, again, broadcast text messages to key contacts working in the affected community, notifying them of the additional food vouchers which are available, school feeding programs which will be initiated in this community. And finally, once the crisis is over, Pulse Lab reviews its work. The outcomes of that review are fed into the software so that more of the process is automated in the future. Okay, so that story was only ever offered as a provocation to thinking at a particular event, not a proposal or a blueprint. But I think in the context of much larger governance transformations which are currently underway, especially around the integration of big data into governance architectures, it contains some very interesting elements. The world painted in this scenario is one in which new sensory architectures transform the conduct of governance encouraging greater attentiveness on the part of decision makers to real-time data about human well-being. Making people and their problems visible in this world elevates their policy salience, while new sensory regimes also modify the temporality of decision making, enabling faster response and learning cycles. Together, I think we have here an ethos of adaptability and flexibility in decision making structures. Note that most of what we currently think of as governance occurs off stage in this vignette. The overarching policy objectives pursued are treated as given in advance and indeed quite unproblematically so. When they're referenced, it's in the generic language of humanitarianism or development or in, languages, in language which emphasizes their self-evidently positive nature, protecting populations from imminent harm or in fact by reference to the SDGs, given in advance, generically defined. So the choices which are made in defining public policy goals, it seems, are not really the most difficult or most salient element of governance in this world. Nor in fact are the choices involved in allocating resources between priorities, or um, again, creating an administrative infrastructure for program delivery. All of that occurs off stage. What is governing in that vignette? To govern is to respond in real time to crises in pursuit of pre-established, generically defined goals. Governance capacity is the ability to monitor the world and respond in real time to the events thrown up by a natural world full of risk and sources of vulnerability. This is a world that demands constant monitoring and modeling. If we are to predict and respond to threats, so the production of more and more data is critical and the business of governance is more and more about real-time response to incessant data flow. So good and effective governance in this imaginary entails the ability to discern real signals from background noise. It involves creating systems for making and implementing rapid but provisional decisions as well as putting in place feedback loops to learn on the run. This is governance by dashboard or governance as product design. And if there is one thing that Sheila's work and STS scholarship more generally has taught us, it's that visions such as that one can be central in performatively building our collective futures. And in my field of international law, 
This lesson has been learnt and internalised in only some corners and there's much more that can and should be done to pursue it. What do visions like that one do to the conduct of governance at the global level, in the development space but also more generally? What worlds are they helping to construct? To what end and for whose benefit? Such questions matter and no one has done more than Sheila to put them on the table and to provide us with the key tools that we need to ask them properly. For that we owe her a debt and I am delighted to have the privilege of marking that debt in today's symposium. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, Professor Lang. We now have a break for around 20 minutes. We meet again at 10.45. 10.45. Thank you. <laughs>
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed your coffee break. Please uh, find your seats. Not as soon as humanly possible, but uh, quickly. So, welcome back, everyone, to the second half of this exciting symposium in honor of Holberg Laureate 2022, Professor Sheila Jasanov. Um, our third speaker today is Associate Professor Ben Hurlbut. He's Associate Professor in the School of Life Sciences at Arizona State University and trained in Science and Technology Studies, STS, which is an acronym you should have um, come to understand so far. Hurlbut has focused on the history of the modern biomedical and life sciences, and his research lies at the intersection of STS, bioethics, and political theory. He studies the changing relationships between science, politics, and law in the governance of biomedical research and innovation, examining the interplay of science and technology with democracy, rel religious and moral pluralism, and public reason. Hurlbut is the author of books like Experiments in Democracy, Human Embryo Research and Politics of Bioethics, which came out in 2017. And he also co-edited the work Perfecting Human Futures, Transhuman Visions and Technological Imaginations from 2016. He has also published uh, numerous articles in leading international journals, as well as contributed with many uh, chapters in key books within his field. He holds an AB from Stanford University and a PhD in the history of science from Harvard University. He was a postdoctoral fellow in the program on science, technology, and society at the Harvard Law School. The title of his presentation is Science, Progress, and Other Reasons in the plural. Dr. Hulbert, the floor is yours. So thank you very much, Bjorn. Um, it's really a great honor and a pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you to the whole Holberg team who's made this experience such a pleasure so far. Um, but for me, the real pleasure is to get to participate in this wonderful celebration of Sheila Jasanoff, because Sheila, for me, has been a mentor, interlocutor, and intellectual inspiration for me as well as for many others. Um, but also because she is perhaps the, the clearest, most compelling, and most innovative thinker on one of the most crucial issues of our time, the constitutive place of science and technology in the fabric of 21st century democracy. And, and finally, because she practices what she preaches in a, in a really remarkable way, a deep commitment to epistemic humility, a conviction that ideas matter, and a fierce dedication to fostering collective thought and to making it durable by building up a scholarly community in STS, something of which I am a great beneficiary. Um, so it's really wonderful to participate um, in, in uh, this celebration of this most extraordinary honor bestowed upon this most deserving scholar. And th this award really could not be more timely, given, given the ways her work speaks to the present moment. In the nearly 20 years since I wandered into her graduate seminar as a first year PhD student, um, the challenges posed by science and techno technology for democracy have only become more significant. The then embryonic um, uh, internet has become the constitutive tissue of social and political life. Climate change and thus climate science have redefined global politics uh, and global citizenship. Reading the human genome, a costly and laborious project at the turn of the century, has given way to the aspiration to rewrite it. Uh, and the challenges to the sense of human integrity and dignity uh, captured, for example, in the advent of artificial technologies of artificial human embryos, human animal chimera, and other unprecedented interventions into human biology make the ethical and political controversies surrounding uh, cloning and embryo research of two decades ago look tame. And finally, of course, this pandemic virus, which has spread through the technological vasculature of our interconnected world, 
um, has also uh, elevated the role of experts, of expert judgment in governing our lives, our daily lives, to an unprecedented degree, even as that expertise has come to be a focus of significant suspicion. Um, for instance, in the suspicion that science itself may have been the, the um, perpetrator of this uh, pandemic. So, the tasks for democratic governance of science and technology are legion. These developments have unfolded during a tumultuous period in the lifetime of democracy, particularly American democracy, which is what will be my focus. But in American politics, the trajectories of techno-science and democracy tend to be narrated as if they are unfolding in separate worlds. On the one hand, there's the heroic story of scientific and technological innovation as an engine of national standing, of economic strength and enlightenment, and on the other, a, a strengthening, declensionist story of political and ideological division and distrust, driven lately by a swelling popular appetite for disinformation. Where science and politics intersect, the story goes, it tends to be um, in the politicization of science, the corruption of science by politics. The left laments a perversion of science into misinformation and denialism, the right suspects ideological agendas masquerading as objective expertise. So I want to note that both of these stories of corruption are also simultaneously stories of purity. Value-free science stands separate from value-laden politics. Science done right occupies a transcendent position. The problem is a problem of corruption, of corruption of science by politics. So, please, just keep calm and follow the science. SDS has done much to challenge these stories, bringing science and technology back down to, to earth um, by interrogating these powerful institutions of modernity as socially situated human achievements. But Sheila Jasanoff has done uh, more than anyone else, I think, to elaborate the, con the constitutive and indeed the constitutional position of science and technology in the fabric of political modernity, the co-production of knowledge and norms, science and politics, technology and law. Her work leads us out of the abstractions of political theory and of philosophical epistemology into the textured practices of the social world where the epistemologies and political imaginaries we live by are authored and enacted. She's shown how ways of publicly reasoning together and of knowing together are central to and deeply embedded within political cultures and that epistemic credibility is not a precondition for the political legitimacy of expertise but is co-produced with it. Looking at this, at science and technology through this co-productionist lens, um, sort of flips a gestalt switch that brings new dimensions into one's field of vision. This is, of course, Thomas Kuhn's um, rabbit duck, the, the sort of um, visual representation of the paradigm shift. One can see one but not the other at, at any given moment. So there, there are sort of two shifts that I just want to flag here. And this is kind of Jasanoffian STS 101. First, one sees the textured ways that democracies know in the course of governing, that civic communities have civic epistemologies. And one sees that they are sui generis, not measurable against some placeless universal standard. Expertise is not universal. Experts are recognized and authorized in different ways by different political communities. The second, and this is sort of where I want to focus, it invites attention to the ways science and technology are themselves sites of political vision and aspiration performances of power and legitimacy, vessels for imaginations of progress and the good, uh, and of the right ordering of lives and societies. So looked at in this way, these sort of taken for granted distinctions um, uh, can no longer be trusted as distinctions, but rather become set pieces in a larger story. It's not merely that the line dissipates, rather asserting the line as an act of world making. So they have to be taken not as a division, but as a kind of a package. So this separation story is a familiar story. Um, this is Michael Polanyi from his classic essay, The Republic of Science. Uh, the soil of academic science must be extraterritorial in order to secure its rule by scientific opinion. Uh, for science to be science, it must be sovereign. Okay, so maybe we can, you know, problematize or dismiss this extraterritoriality as a fiction, um, and with good reason. But what I want to focus on here um, is, is what it means for democracy when that fiction becomes a kind of constitutive political imaginary. So let's go back to following the science. 
This is, of course, the slogan that has sort of been deployed by the left in American pandemic politics um, to sort of demand public deference to expertise. So I think it's notable that this was um, deployed in a context of, in, of enormous division and controversy, and really thus is a kind of diagnosis of democratic failure, a rebuke of, of the controversy um, uh, and dissent surrounding expert-driven public health uh, guidance in its response to the pandemic. So on the surface, it's sort of a call for democratic disagreement to give way to scientific univocality. But I think importantly, more fundamentally, it's a way of dismissing democratic disagreement as illegitimate, and thus sort of not dealing with its substance, because dissidents are not abiding by the accepted rules of reason. It certainly calls upon citizens to defer to expert advice, but it simultaneously asserts a notion of what is good citizenship and civic responsibility. If we follow the science, we know what to do, what policies to make and how to behave. But also, and I think this is important, we would be a we, a unified polity that has subordinated itself to the right sovereign. So it's a kind of, it's a kind of diagnosis of political dysfunction. Uh, and, and I think it's also worth noting that this is not an invitation to democratic deliberation. It's a sort of shut up and do as you're told, shut up and follow the science. Um, so the, the kind of subordination is the key move here. Um, so this is, in that sense, um, less about the, the um, epistemic authority of expertise, but more about the authorization of power and the relations between so different sovereignties and tension the sovereign state, sovereign science, and the sovereign self, the one who chooses, give me liberty or give me COVID-19. So again, the admonition to follow science is not merely about citizens becoming informed and knowledgeable such that they can make good choices. It's about getting on board with the right sort of deference to authority and about marking that authority as legitimate. It's, you might say, a sort of political theory of the right relationship between scientific expertise and political authority. So I think you can see how in this moment of extremity, the imperative to defer to science subsumes multiple different dimensions of, of uh, democratic politics. Let me just offer a few. I mean, this is uh, electoral politics, the sort of legitimacy of, of the authority. But what, it, I mean, what is it that the people have voted for? The people have, have chosen science. This is from the Biden-Harris um, victory party. Um, there, there's a kind of imaginary of solidarity here. Um, I, I think this is really a kind of remarkable statement. This is a statement made by President Biden on his the sort of Declaration of Independence on July 4th, um, whenever that was, 2021. Okay, a premature declaration. But back then we had the power of an idea on our side. Today we have the power of science, what binds us together as a polity. And here, this is an article from Nature magazine um, that, you know, in a sense sort of presents who is and what is the ultimate authority, the arbiter of, of good governance, of, of political authority. Has Biden followed the science? What do the, what do the scientists say? So I think the pandemic example is illustrative because it unfolds in a sort of moment of crisis. And so the imaginary somehow intensifies and kind of reaches a fever pitch, a sort of, a sort of uh, fundamentalism. But it's important to appreciate that this moment is a kind of abnormal intensification of a normal politics, one that has important consequences for democratic deliberation and judgment. So I want to illustrate these general dynamics, the sort of the more normal form of normal politics, um, uh, that imbue scientific expertise with a kind of custodial role in shaping democratic deliberation. I'm going to offer a ser series of examples, but, but just to give a kind of a schematic account of what's going on here. So first is the notion that science is a sort of starting point for discovering overlapping consensus. The, the, what binds together a polity, first and foremost, is the, is the facts of the matter um, around which questions of political judgment um, coalesce. So science supplies the given and advanced common ground as a basis for reasoned public deliberation. Whoops, I'm sorry. Um, in practice, this means that experts, uh, in effect, are invited to delimit premises held in common. They define that common good. I mean, in plenty of instances, that, that there's a sort of claim that is asserted. 
Um, but I think that that claim is asserted in the context of a sort of, a, a sort of imagination that it's a um, rightful and authorized claim, a sort of invitation to assert it. And the effect here is that epistemic authority is empowered to define conditions of political participation, the rules of engagement, the terms of debate, and so forth. Um, with important consequences, let me note, for trust in political institutions and for a sense of voice and political recognition. I think that this sort of uh, imaginary of perfected politics has a lot to do with the sort of political pathologies that we are contending with in the United States at the moment. So I want to illustrate these dynamics by looking at a few different dimensions of this sort of imaginary of sovereign science that authorizes its constitutional position. And these are just little, little uh, sort of examples around these, um, these sort of thematic features. And the first one I want to point to is linearity. Um, so this is, you know, the linear model from science to technology to society, from, from basic to applied and then out into the world. And of course, there, there are ample reasons to be um, suspicious of this as an account of innovation. Um, but I think that the way to see this is more as a sort of governing imagination of relations between different, uh, different institutions, those institutions of science, technology, and, and social and political institutions. And what I want to focus on here is how the, the sort of notion of an extraterritorial science of a sovereign science disciplines democratic deliberation. So, I mean, this is a, just a sort of throwaway a uh, statement, advances in science and technology raise ethical questions. But I, what I want to point to here is the way in which this sort of sequence of, of uh, political, of public reflection and judgment, the ethical questions follows the sequence of, of a kind of model of linear innovation. Science and technology act first, society reacts. So economy is a, as a sort of a project that isn't um, prescriptive about its particular outputs, um, but is rather about capacity building um, for social transformation. Um, but but uh, the place of politics in that is imagined as attaching only to the products that spin out of um, this infrastructure of innovation. Public acceptance of the products of the bioeconomy cannot be addressed at the level of the, bi the bioeconomy as a whole. Each product or service or technological innovation developed by the bioeconomy will be judged by the public uh, on its own merits. So this defers and displaces democratic deliberation even as it sort of naturalizes a, a kind of techno-scientific project as well as the market that's back of it. Um, and and uh, so a, a sort of key thing to see here is the, is the sequencing of the commitments and the ways in which um, the upstream commitments in the domain of science and technology are immune to the sort of, or are meant to be immune to the sort of, of uh, um, democratic scrutiny and correction um, that, want, that might come with taking the project itself as an object of political concern. Here's a, a second example. Expertise is a kind of custodian of democratic reason. This comes from a moment in the mid-2000s during American sort of very, very significant political controversy around stem, human embryonic stem cell research and cloning. Um, and this is a piece that was published in Science Magazine um, arguing that, that uh, cloning, the term cloning, was a, posed a problem for processes of democratic deliberation about about the sort of ethical governance of this emerging technology. Cloning has a popular connotation that is impossible to dislodge. Thus, we must accept that democratic debate on cloning is bereft of any meaning. So the disjunction between public understanding, putative public understanding of what the term cloning means and what the experts know that term to mean, what they know to be its referent, uh, becomes a basis for diagnosing democratic dysfunction itself. We must accept that democratic debate on cloning is bereft of any meaning. Science and scientists would be better served by choosing other words to explain advances in developmental biotechnology to the public. This, this uh, effort, um, sort of culminates in a series of, of legal cases around state-level referenda, direct democratic referenda, um, in the provision of information to voters about what it is that they're voting on, um, where a series of lawsuits are brought uh, arguing that, you know, a, a 
provision of information that includes the language of cloning is an is a exercise in, in effect, defrauding democracy um, because the, the language is inaccurate, is not true to nature. So the, the sort of custodianship of truth to nature becomes a custodianship um, of democracy itself. Here's a third example. Um, this is from a, the Presidential Commission on Bioethical Issues, the public bioethics body under the, the Obama administration. Um, this, this bioethics body was headed up by Amy Gutman, who is a very prominent theorist of deliberative democracy. And the spirit in which uh, that body undertook its approach was informed by that sort of, that sort of vision of, uh, of deliberative democracy. Um, they called for, and this is a report on emerging biotechnologies that was inspired by advances in synthetic biology, the first um, sort of entirely synthetically produced microorganism, or rather a microorganism with a synthetically produced genome. So th the body called for an inclusive process of deliberation informed by relevant facts and sensitive to ethical concerns, which promotes an atmosphere to, for debate and decision making that looks for common ground. And yet, almost immediately, the body, in order to facilitate that kind of democratic reason, calls for a kind of expert-based disciplinary mechanism uh, to, to constrain it, a publicly accessible fact-checking mechanism for public, public claims about prominent advances in biotechnology whose purpose would be to facilitate reasoned deliberation and improve public perception and acceptance of emerging technologies. The examples that they give of the kind of discourse which would need to be fact-checked and sort of disciplined out of public space are phrases like playing God and creating life. Back of this, of course, is a notion not just of public reason, but of what public reason in the, is in the service of, of the kind of progressive achievements um, of a robust uh, democratic process. And, and uh, here I want to point to the ways in which the sort of notion of linearity also becomes a sort of notion of the position from which futures are best imagined. That is from the, the position of science and technology. Um, here is a, another National Academies report from the late 2000s, a new biology for the 21st century, laying out its, its program, um, describing what, what trajectory biology should follow uh, over the course of the century. Um, it describes the role of that biology as enunciating, that this new biology will enunciate and address broad and challenging societal problems. So this is not just the appropriation of societal problems in the form of solutions, but also in the form of, of diagnosis, in the form of declaration of, of, of uh, um, what requires response. And of course, this is a sort of old pattern. This, is a, this was a statement made by a group of prominent scientists in 1977 in response to emergent legislation uh, that, that was intending to regulate um, the new technology of recombinant DNA. Um, and that legislative project was in effect shut down um, by the prediction that it would inhibit the good that would flow from um, an unfettered uh, science and technology, that it was premature because science had not yet produced the technology that was on the threshold of making its way into society. The benefits of recombinant DNA research will be denied to, to society by unnecessarily restrictive legislation. This has become a kind of a central story in American lawmaking about um, the ways in which to restrain or not restrain uh, innovation. This is Harold Varmus sitting next to the creator of Dolly the Sheep in, in uh, hearings on um, cloning, uh, declaring that legislation and science frequently do not mix very well. So Congress, please stay out of it. There's a sense in which the notion that the law lags behind science, science races ahead and law and ethics and wider society lag behind, is captured also in this sort of injunction against uh, intervention, premature intervention, legislative intervention into the spaces of scientific and technological innovation. This is Marsha McNutt, the president of the National Academy of Sciences, and making a sort of statement that, you know, one hears all over the place. As is always the case, the speed at which the science is advancing outpaces society's ability to grasp its implications. One hears this particularly frequently from lawyers who are in the business of thinking about law in relation to technology. I want to point to the ways in which this 
in which that notion of the relationship between science and law as institutions produces a particular relationship between science and law as institutions and in effect authorizes science to race ahead and society to lag behind. So this is the um, researcher who produced genetically engineered babies in China. And here is an explanation of his own sort of motivations. If we're waiting for society to reach a consensus, it's never going to happen. But once one or a couple of scientists makes the first kid, it's safe, it's healthy, then the entire society, including science, ethics, and law, will be accelerated. They will speed up and make new rules. So I acted. I broke the glass. The corollary to this is a sort of notion of inevitability, that along the linear trajectory, science and technology progress progressively, but also inevitably, such that the reactions that can come are always, in a sense, framed and delimited by what the world that science and technology have brought into being. I think that seeing that inevitability in conjunction with the sort of notions of progress also attunes one to see the ways in which ideas of the good, ideas of what sort of lives we should have, what sort of world we should be, um, get laid claim to by these scientific and technological initiatives. This is the Chan Zuckerberg initiative sort of stated aspiration to cure all disease in our children's lifetime. This is money that has come from, you know, a technological infrastructure that has produced extraordinary pathologies for, for uh, um, political communities. This is a, a, just one final little illustration here. This is a statement made at, at last year's um, Congress for Reproductive Medicine in the United States, which is an enormous gathering, thousands of, of uh, physicians and others in the business of reproductive medicine, in which, um, looking back over the past 40 years of, of reproductive medicine, the president of that society looked forward to a future in which all reproduction takes place outside of the human body. I think what I want to draw attention to here is the way that this is laying claim not just to scientific and technological progress, but to a kind of idea of human progress. This is a technological elaboration of, of a sort of, of fundamental rights, of reproductive rights, of a kind of liberty right, uh, a right of the sovereign self to escape the constraints of the body. This is, of course, at the same moment in which a, the big C constitutional foundations of reproductive rights in the United States, the right to abortion, is being undone. Note that, I mean, these are not unrelated developments. Both are, in effect, doing politics by other means through forms of, of expertise and, and uh, um, expert prowess. That undoing is not least about the question of religious and secular moralities and um, their relation to the governance of human life. The sort of question, can science make sense of life, is answered not necessarily with a yes, but a, a kind of notion that it should. So this is the, last, um, the, the sort of last dimension that I want to touch upon. Um, the ways in which um, notions of, of science as secular, as intrinsically secular and as intrinsically public, it is about public demonstration, um, and, and, uh, and thus um, uh, lives on the sort of public side of a public-private distinction, on the secular side of a distinction between secular re reason and spiritual belief. Um, Note, of course, that this sort of policing function is about that. It's about constituting public reason, democratic deliberation in a secular idiom, a, a secular idiom that is grounded in sort of, sort of public knowledge, expert certified public knowledge. But the norms of reasoning are not so rigidly adhered to um, in spaces of science and technology. The presumption of secularity, in effect, sets scientific voices free to talk in a, in a non-secular idiom. This is um, a book by the Nobel laureate Jennifer Doudner, the inventor of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing, um, and by George Church, a kind of maverick in the domain of biotechnology. Um, you know, I mean, talk about playing God, right? Um, so I, I want us to sort of see the ways in which these, the, the sort of taking liberty um, with meaning with the meaning of life, with the authority to make sense of life, is authorized by the sort of imaginary of a value-neutral, disenchanted um, science that, that stands back of a politics of deliberation. It's an easy slippage from that and a quick slippage from that um, morally neutral, disenchanted science to a kind of messianic vision of technology. <clears throat> 
this is uh, the uh, um, book by the um, editor, a molecular biologist who's the editor of the CRISPR journal. This is just sort of really captures it very nicely. Um, the term holy grail is overused in science, but if fixing a single letter in the genetic code of a fellow human being isn't the coveted chalice of salvation, I don't know what is. So Jürgen Habermas in his Holberg lecture about 15 years ago spoke of the need for encounter across the religious secular divide. This was a shift in Habermas's thinking. Um, and and a, an important and very valuable one. But he says, religious citizens must develop an epistemic stance towards the independence of secular from sacred knowledge and the institutionalized monopoly of modern science on what we know about states and events in the world. In other words, that construction of, of a kind of renewed public reason necessary to respond to the transformations of the 21st century takes for granted distinctions, in particular the distinction between secular and religious, um, that are rather asserted and enacted, in a sense settled in advance of the questions um, that are fundamental to them and that therefore belong in the sort of political public sphere. Science, in effect, does normative political theory that escapes the notice even of the most sophisticated political theorists in the field uh, itself. Okay. So I've, sh I've tried to show how science and technology are loci and arbiters of, so of, of social, which is to say rational, epistemic, moral, and political authority. They're engaged in boundary work, constructing and policing and transgressing distinctions between science and non-science, fact and value, secular and religious, public and private, and, and, and all by virtue of being embedded in a sort of imaginary of progressive and, and um, uh, secular and, and progressiveness and secularity. So what's at stake? The constitutive and constitutional vocabularies of you know, democratic politics themselves, the right, the reasonable, the held in common. Thus, the world-making authority of expertise, which is paired, which is coupled in a fundamental way to the politics of authorization of that world-making authority. So at stake are horizons of democratic imagination uh, and governance. What, what matters here is not merely the science and technology that we have, but the forms of democratic politics that we have. And I, I want to finish by just making a comment about what we might think about as a sort of a civic virtue um, that is, is, uh, seems contradictory to the imperative to follow the science, um, but actually you know, invites space for the forms of dissent and deliberation um, that can render a space for politics to unfold. That is ambivalence. Thinking of ambivalence as a civic virtue um, and a technology of humility. And I think um, as we think about the ways in which um, our backward age um, advances under the banner of progress, um, these words from T.S. Eliot um, capture quite profoundly our predicament. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation, uh, Dr. Hulwood. The last speaker at this Holberg Symposium is Professor Patricia Williams. She holds appointments in both the School of Law and the Department of Philosophy at Northeastern University. Patricia Williams is also the James L. Dorr Professor of Law Emerita at Columbia Law School. Professor Williams has served on a number of faculties, including the University of Wisconsin School of Law, City University of New York Law School, and Golden Gate University School of Law. Williams has been a fellow at the School of Criticism and Theory at Dartmouth College, as well as at the Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. Williams practiced as Deputy City Attorney for the Office of the Los Angeles City Attorney and as staff lawyer for the Western Center on Law and Poverty. She's published widely in the areas of race, gender and law, and on other issues of legal theory and legal writing. Her books include The Alchemy of Race and Rights, The Rooster's Egg, and Seeing a Colorblind Future, The Paradox of Race. In total, she has authored six books and hundreds of professional articles. Williams has also been a columnist for The Nation and is a prolific writer and commentator.
Williams has also served on the board of trustees at Wellesley College and is the, and is the recipient of seven honorary degrees and of a MacArthur Genius Grant. The title of her presentation is The Regulation of Hubris, which we might need, as uh, Ben alluded to. So, Professor Williams, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. It is such a privilege to be here, such an honor to be here. Um, I am really overwhelmed by the privilege of this opportunity, and I extend my thanks to the Holberg Committee, uh, to Ellen and Bjorn in particular for chasing me down when I wasn't reading my emails. <laughs> um, and of course, many, many thanks to Sheila for her extraordinary body of work and that work which has shaped my own career for at least the last two decades. Uh, and I guess I should say that the core subject that I teach is contract law. I've basically spent many, many years of my life teaching lawyer hatchlings how to go straight to Wall Street how to deploy the language of market um, to very particular monetizing ends. Uh, but in that study, the aesthetic power of visualized imaginaries that exist as potential within this body of law of contract, which nobody thinks of as having any imagination <laughs> and nothing visual to it, um, is really striking to me, and particularly since the sort of overwhelming power of what some have called the fourth uh, industrial revolution, the, um, the power of this, what we call, new technology. Um, and this imaginary of different kinds of expertise and its connection to common sense um, so affects the ligaments of how we are constituted as a society, as a nation, indeed as a species. Um, and so I find Sheila's thought coming to me in the most peculiar moments. And so I was at a conference not too long ago, and it was just after what Ben uh, described as you know, the, the, the supposed discovery of the tool of CRISPR, at that time CRISPR-Cas9. And uh, I was sitting in a room, and there was an expert, the expert, who was passing around a model of CRISPR, quote, so you can see it and hold it. This is what it actually looks like. Now, for certain purposes, it certainly wasn't what it looks like. Um, it was a magnification of something that is really amorphous, a paradox, a seeing of something we can't see, but it was rendered in this plastic thing you know, about this size. Um, and I looked at it and I realized the influence of Professor Jasanoff because I looked at it and I said, this isn't CRISPR, this is a Jasanovian metaphor. It was sculptural, colorful. It was even painted in red, white, and blue, the colors of the American flag, no less. It was playful, like a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. It was bounded, plastic, but passive. We could handle it, understand it, pass it up and down the aisles to the next person. It was a focused rendering of how it works and how it looks, but it was an it. And yet the expert who had modeled this said, it is going to eliminate deleterious genes. And the promise of eliminating deleterious genes was greeted with a sort of collective sigh of awe, and it was handled and even stroked by some in the audience like a religious totem. It was also that language, this is going to eliminate deleterious genes, that made me think of the very first time I met Sheila Jasanoff. Um, she hosted a really brilliant conference 
in which she brought together a variety of voices, including the then relatively unknown Anne Wojcicki, who had just opened or begun um, her business as the CEO of the Personal Genomics County, uh, Company, rather, 23andMe. And she was the featured speaker. And even before any word was spoken in the conference, the poster for the conference was, or presented, an image, a metaphor, that was powerfully suggestive of the values embedded in this, in the presentation, in the sale, in the manufacture of this new technology. The title of that talk was entitled, Deleterious Me, Whole Genome Sequencing 23 and Me and the Crowdsourced Healthcare Revolution. And the poster for this conference depicted the double helix as a spiral staircase with little Lego-like people climbing upwards, ever upwards, toward a mysteriously glimmering heaven. It was a little like some of that image that I saw in Silke's presentation um, in her first slide. And I was extremely, I remain extremely grateful to have been invited to that conversation, um, that conversation so long ago um, that was alarming and ahead of its time. It was a brilliantly provocative gathering of voices, perspective, cultures, and disciplines. And I've been writing about it to some degree ever since. And that poster, just the image, <laughs> provided a very effective metaphor for my concerns about this entire subject, this industry, this bioperspective enterprise. DNA was figured in the popular imagination as an inevitably uplifting stairway to heaven, an infallible path to higher truth, during the, doing the heavy barbell lifting toward utopia. And this is world-making. That, I worry, leads to a credulous suspension of both ethics and caution. It frames the deploy of genetic expertise as a promise, or not just a promise, but an invitation in, of inev to inevitable worlds of betterment, health, wisdom, and bright futures. It is framed as a guarantee, in other words a contract. And consider again the peculiar location of Anne Wojcicki's very title, Deleterious Me. It posited the intimacy of me, the individual, as inherently self-destructive. It's an odd but very effective and increasingly ubiquitous recasting of mortality as autoimmunity. One's essence, the me, is framed as noxious, diseased, and decaying. Health care and health, by contrast, are positioned on the other side of that colon, whole genome sequencing and crowdsourced health care revolution. They are located squarely in the geography of crowd as source. If the individual is framed as dangerous, lonely, and self-annihilating, its rescue lies in the comfort of crowds, safety in numbers, and collective shelter from the harmful me. There is power in this conjoint set, set of idealized genetic references, a poignant longing for embodied self-perfection, yet fear and loathing of the assured self-betrayal. It's also worth noting that the deleterious me was expressed, contained, and presented in a grammatical form, the objective case. That which is passive, placed as the object of an unnamed verb, a Cartesian subject that must be protected, that is assumed to have the moral prerogative to act in self-defense, a self in need of acting to eliminate that deleterious me, self-improvement through deletion. And there's something very nearly Shakespearean about the tension, tremulously human, mythically themed, with just a hint of hovering tragedy. Indeed, the urgencies of our technological revolution seem set on some theatrical public stage, some Faustian oratorio where narrative and necromancy meet for a solemn duet. Indeed, in the 21st century, our greatest passion plays are placed not in a public constitutional setting, but in the realm of private contract rather than public good or participatory democracy. So it is that Labs like George Church's or Craig Venter's 
or privately held companies like 23andMe can own, store, and resell to anyone the most elemental biological markers of individual identity while marketing themselves as direct con to consumer purveyors of, quote, personal self-knowledge. Indeed, in one statement, 23andMe's representative, Ms. Wojcicki, said, customer, consumer, purchaser, and citizen are all the same thing, and that there is no difference among consumers, customers, purchasers, and citizens. But there is. And if we try to fight any of our battles on behalf of only customers, consumers, and purchasers, we are instantly limited by a contract frame. We will already have acceded to a market model with the, late, the, the least moral stake in any kind of collective regulation because consumers are contractors and contractors act alone. They are rugged individualists. They choose their fate with little discernible detriment or interaction with others. And legal and political actions styled as human rights or constitutional law, on the other hand, will tend to have a greater societal and therefore structural impact than those focused in or on contract. Not perfect, but again, a difference. In order to recognize the human interest, the personhood of people, we need to root claims in languages that invoke the values of citizenship, or at least the aspirations of what we mean by citizenship in law. And we live in a world where actual and fleshed human beings, citizen beings, have become more and more dispossessed in the allocations of research and medical dollars, exiled by a exclusive obsession with an exploitation of microbiomes, and more recently now, in the brave new world of CRISPR, its immense transformative power we are failing to take into account the degree to which the privileges and immunities of citizenship as at least a putative marker of our humanity are depleted by propitiatory sacrifice, not merely to homo economicus, nor even homo faber or man the creator, but to man the manufactured, including some very potentially unhappy cybergs, automatons, and what I was called recently um, by a techie friend of mine, a data object. So the narrowing of ethical concern from human health to products that fix or perfect means that other aspects of market value are driving this pursuit. And all of these forces conspire to create a world and a citizenry of fewer and fewer mobile or speaking subjects. Instead, we become locked into a shell-like status fixed by carelessly composed data sets, as well as uninterrogated correlations made by invisible bureaucrats. And without oversight or due process, it is harder and harder to challenge, never mind to find out why we came to be labeled a this rather than a that, a flight risk or a cancer risk, a quick learner or a big spender. Like it or not, and willingly or not, these are the identity groupings by which we will be judged and from which we will struggle increasingly to escape. Yet however reductive, these markers of our identity are valuable as intellectual property. They become monetized nuggets in the knowledge economy, little Lego pieces of data used to construct the avatars and facsimiles that stand in for us in a world repositioned as efficiently heuristic rather than participatorily democratic. Genes, cells, fingerprints, blood, or isolated phenotypes become immortal ciphers or fixed character properties. Governments, pharmaceutical companies, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, attribute to particularized pieces of ourselves a separate life that engulfs or becomes more important than our complex embodied selves. Perhaps it is very similar as a conceptual matter to what happened in the beginnings of the corporation. In his commentaries on the laws of England, 18th century English jurist William Blackstone described early entrepreneurs' concern with the basic limits of their own humanity. People die, that's bad for business. And the invention of the corporation effectively created an immortal legal subject untethered to human frailty. 
And that immortality is, in effect, a way of extruding from particular bodies a use value that can be assigned to the ether of legal fiction, a fiction that speaks through articles of incorporation and whose profit may be divvied up among distant abstract shareholders. And I think that there's a similar process of dispossession in the mining of our habits and our bodies, our preferences and dispositions. It is framed as not about us, at least as individuals, even though it may be used to powerfully confine us as individuals. It can be used to mark us, even as it rarely can be claimed by us. It's rather about one's group, one's place, one's purportedly anonymized metrics. And the reconfiguration of the righted subject into what is effectively an instantiation of the person as corporation has two implications for how we humans or the human is perceived. First, the value of the individual is rewritten as alienable rather than inalienable, as cost benefit, profit motivated, and value added. This explains, I suppose, the conversation I overheard among a group of high school students on the subway, busily working on a homework assignment in which they had been asked to brand themselves, to give that brand a catchy name, and to sell that brand in no more than five sentences because, quote, with more than five sentences, you lose your audience. <laughs> Secondly, corporatized people don't need healing. And indeed, the rules of corporate law bend away from the idea of justice as individually remedial or collectively or personally restorative. A corporate being looks to the law not for civil rights, but for the predictive, the risk minimizing, the future controlling immortality of guaranteed return. Through that lens, any legal system based on consent or on, indiv or on individual cases and controversies begins to look cumbersome in comparison to the speedy efficiency of econometric models. We in the industrialized world who conduct most of our work and play, indeed our entire lives, with the assistance of computers, are always pressing little buttons that say, I agree to terms of service, conditions of usage, privacy limitations that we never bother to read. And consider how ritualized that behavior has become. The act of consent rendered thoughtless, invisibly performative in a way that disappears any need for negotiated participation. The surface language of contract effectively marked only, or marking only, a site of erasure. And so, in the name of better interpretability and mind reading, we are increasingly relying on machines, on facial recognition, algorithmic mood discerners that read our muscles with anatomical precision, and then deliver these phenotypical profiles as transparently factual of what lies beneath. And so the figure of the human as an undecipherable mush, a sloppily organic mess of engorged flesh and blood, that typological framing is rapidly giving way to an exoskeletal assemblage of mind data points. And in this turn to digitized cyborgs, I worry that we have not sufficiently interrogated an underlying cultural faith that feelings, motives, and the interior states can be read with a precision we think of as both neutrality and perfection. We don't seem to be questioning whether there will ever really can be an interpretation machine, an assigner of meaning that will be more accurate than the psychologically read body or the jurisprudentially read body or the conceptually autonomous legal subject. There simply must be. At a different point in time, it was phrenology. Today, it is an algorithmically read body that will tell all. We forget that all itself is an abstraction. And so we place our face faith in the ubiquitous images of trillions of little white dots in the shape of humans, the biometric data constellations of human form that supposedly represent our species, the machine-learned vision of Vitruvian man. Finally, the question of temporalities as world building has come up a number of times in our conversation. And how we might unsettle what we do solely 
in the name of progress. The notion of progress has, of course, for quite a few centuries now, been rooted in a vision of time that is largely religiously inflected. And I'm thinking of John Bunyan's enormously influential allegory, The Pilgrim's Progress, published in 1678. In it, Christian, our hero, sets out from his home, the city of destruction, to seek the uphill path past the slew of despond toward the city on the hill, which is heaven. The way is paved with sin and dangerous opportunities, but the value Christian exemplifies is resistance of that temptation. Indeed, the hard labor of resisting is symbolized in the directionality of pressing uphill, always upward, and traveling uphill also signifies traveling forward in time into the future, the uphill future which contains the joyful promise of heaven which is to come. And Bunyan's vision of staying the course underwrites much of our political discourse to this day. It is mythologized in our imagining of time as an arrow that inevitably points to the better. It is a future time, a future tense that heals all, wound, all wounds. I love the work of Lyra Boroditsky, who, like Sheila, is a linguist who studies the way language structures our sensations of time, of direction, of gender, of life and death and community. And for example, she writes of an Andean language where, unlike Pilgrim's Progress, the future is behind us and the past is in front or ahead. And it's interesting to think of time like that. We inheritors of a Western culture, we speakers of English in particular, tend to think of time as a kind of, ro of road that proceeds from the known terrain we have already traversed and into the unknown lands of places we have yet to reach. In contrast, the future is behind us. It rearranges our focus. And I think it might make us less motion-filled, more cautious. Our mothers teach us to put one foot ahead of the other to get ahead. It takes more balance and deliberation to think of moving into the future by putting one foot behind the other. It slows us a bit. Behind is what you can't see in this model. In front of you is what you can see, what you have seen, and therefore what you know. As bipedal creatures, we tend to walk into the spaces that are in front of us. Therefore, in this Andean language, we are consistently walking into historical dimensions, moving forward through history, a bit like Walter Benjamin's angel. And that is a substantially different vision of how most Western languages or systems of thought configure our imaginative geography. The human is distinguished from, and, and the human, by the human I mean that is distinguished from the figure of the human, is so richly varied, so infinitely creative, so culturally multiplicitous, and our technological imaginary, it seems to me, is too often such a flat landscape, devoid of context, devoid of exchange, devoid of embodied encounter. I keep thinking of the floating bits and pieces of ourselves, the half figures of homeless and refugees and uninsured, those whose lives have been destroyed by reckless public policies. I think of climate di diaspora, flood victims, asylum seekers, and the extinction, the extinction of birds and rhinos and bees. And I have an image in mind, and it's the one actually slide I wish I had brought, um, but you probably have all seen it. Um, it was a photo that recently won gold in the global contest, Birds, Bird Photographer of the Year, and it's called Blocked. It was taken by Alejandro Prieto. It is the image of a roadrunner, that generally flightless bird, <laughs> who is a species of the cuckoo, <laughs> who can run up to 30 miles per hour, and is the subject of cartoonish escapes in Disney, from the figure of Wile E. Coyote. The Roadrunner is a joy joyful joker of a bird whose nomadism is dependent upon the unbounded infinity of desert space in which to wander and forage and hide. And the Roadrunner is, is considered sacred by some indigenous people and a symbol of good luck. And what I think is most interesting about the bird is that it's 
unusual footprint is in the shape of an X. So you can't easily tell what direction it's headed when you're just trying to track it. In other words, you might think you're following its tracks when actually it could be behind you. So no wonder myth casts it as a trickster. But the migratory path of the roadrunner from north to south and back has been blocked by a large section of the wall recently built between the United States and Mexico. Alejandro Prieto's photo is arresting. Indeed, it sort of made my heart stop for a moment when I saw it. The tiny, mostly flightless bird standing in the vast desert before this endless snaking blockage of a very high wall covered in coils of barbed wire snaking through the desert for hundreds of miles. It is a really heartbreaking photo, and Prieto describes that he meant for it to capture the cost and the tragedy of habitat fragmentation that bunkered isolationism of thought, not just material, imposes not just on each other in a time of such human needs, such human diaspora, such pandemic desperation, such need for diminishing resources. It also captures so succinctly the crisis of habitat fragmentation that is being imposed by our technical, technological interventions in the material world. That wall, a human technology that is ordered by very specific and narrow ethical and temporal interests, slices through a landscape and biome ordered by very different temporal and evolutionary regimes, governed by needs and beings that are unacknowledged, unseen, unheard, and ultimately paved over. And I think of this because I think it exemplifies the degree to which there is a crisis of human technology of all sorts, of any sort, a crisis of seeing and being that allows us to impose our imaginative constructs, even when they're quite limited, upon cartographies in ways that eliminate the who, what, where that is literally before our eyes. And this is a moment when technology is no longer a tool, like a hammer or a nail, but an extension of ideological constructs, where technology, like social media platforms, for just one example, have become potent prostheses of meaning-making. It, they, machines and logics enter our brains so that in the name of expending what we call our vision or our, or, or our connectivity, we actually blinder, oursel blinder ourselves to other worlds. We order our logic to actually close down and allow the withering of our, our other capacities to see beyond what technology directs us to see. This is not a problem of technology itself, of course. It's about the way we infused cultural, we infuse cultural values, norms, and expectations into technology. So it's like the gym rat who takes steroids. The muscles of the upper arm look like Popeyes, but other parts of the body wither. Mission accomplished if Popeye is the goal, but it's an imbalance from most other points of view. And as Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel observed, the challenge is really to know what we see rather than to see what we know. And that is a quest and a path that Sheila Jasanoff has set us upon, and her insights are the guideposts and the tools with which we press on. I am so filled with gratitude for that inspiration. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Professor Williams. I would now like to invite Professor Sheila Jasanov and all the four symposiasts, as you are called, uh, onto the stage. Uh, please give them all a round of applause.
discussion here on stage for a bit between us after hearing all these four wonderful um, uh, presentations and uh, Professor Jasanov's uh, introduction. And I will now shift gear and I'll use the first names for all of you and I hope that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, Patricia's question of consent, so we have to consent. Um, after a while, uh, around half an hour, we'll open the floor for questions from the audience. And I do hope that all the inspiring and thought-provoking um, interventions we have heard have generated questions in your head. So please think about allowing the question to get out of your head and into the room through your voice and the microphone. But let us start this way, uh, Sheila. You've now heard four very, very different, but all very thought-provoking uh, um, interventions here on different themes. Uh, would you like to respond in general or to some of them in particular? Let me uh, take the opportunity and respond to, first of all, all of them uh, together. Um, the uh, the first thing to note is just how rich the different qualities of the voices were. They were philosophical, pragmatic, uh, to some extent activist, uh, lyrical. Uh, and, you know, to me that is um, a validation in a way of the humanistic spirit of the Holberg Prize, but also of the field of STS. That is, we don't do social science in a boring way. And, you know, and I think that, that the um, people who were embedded in STS, but also the people who were close neighbors and friends and interlocutors who helped the field develop have illustrated, and these four speakers obviously embody that kind of ability to cross discourses and to speak in ways that are deeply engaging and um, not meant only for the pages of textbooks. So I consider that actually a very important piece of the public role of an intellectual, especially in these days when people increasingly don't understand what experts do when they're world making. And so I thank all of you for um, displaying the, the significance of understanding that kind of role-playing by experts in ways that are, that are accessible. I think Bjorn, you uh, characterized my writing as accessible, but I'm not alone in the field, and I, I think that that is um, one of the first things that I noted. Um, I guess I'd like more to throw out a couple of ideas and then have the four of you talk to one another because you must have been struck by what other people said as well. So there was a theme of making that was uh, going on, not surprisingly, because I put it into the title of the symposium, the world making. Um, but I think that you talked about different resources. I think probably all of you spoke about language, but language plays a different role for lawyers from what from the role it plays for um, people who are sort of observing in a critical fashion. Um, I wonder whether we might spend a little bit of time talking about the relative fixity or non-fixity of language as a tool of making the way that, that you each think about it. I mean, in whose giving is it or in whose gift is it to, to change the discourse? Um, one thing I should just say by the way that actually I felt that my own lecture, which is going to follow all of yours, was without my knowing exactly what you were going to say in a sort of um, imagined dialogue with all of you. So I hope you'll see some of these themes um, cropping up there as well. But so I would be interested in the sort of juxtaposition of language and, and making and for that matter, unmaking. Yesterday, you were at this wonderful dinner, and we finished up with a pavlova as the dessert. And I have an image in my mind of a circular piece of meringue with whipped cream and topped with strawberries. But this had what uh, Luke referred to as a Derridean version of the Pavlova. Uh, so, you know, I think that the, the ways in which language plays out are both to 
uh, you know, take this egg white and make it into something completely different, but also to take a part. And, and, you know, Pat, your work obviously does this brilliantly all the time, that contract law, as you suggested, is, uh, you know, it's enough to make one yawn, but, but in your hands it becomes something alive and, and a place for building and making, but equally global institutions of the sort that, um, that Andrew, you and Zilke talk about, I mean, those are, uh, I, I myself will talk a little bit about the World Trade Organization and my experience with that. These are not places of poetry. <laughs> I mean, these are places where ideas go to die. <laughs> so, and, and yet I think what all of you are talking about is how ideas don't necessarily have to go to die. Uh, and Ben, needless to say, your work has been imbued with a sort of feel for the plasticity of language and ideas and the ability of people to insert themselves into what might look like a fixed uh, field of understanding and, and reveal through the co-productionist lens how the, the material and the um, discursive are operating together to both make worlds of value when you know people are not aware of it but also once they become aware of it then to be armed to go into the fray in, in a different sort of way and so um, perhaps a second theme that you might want to talk about is how we might cultivate that spirit of awareness or attentiveness in our audiences I mean, because so much of the education that we give to people is to make them able to get around in the world as if they have the passports and as if they have the identity cards and not to be too questioning because if they are they might, may run into trouble i mean you know we know that when you're going through an airport security line you know the I will ask the questions and you will give the answers. Uh, norm is very operative. I don't know how many of you have ever asked an airport security person a question other than should I take off my shoes, my belt, and you know, denude myself of everything you know, metallic that I possess and so on. Um, so, so where and how can one cultivate a productively questioning mind? And I think that this Maybe, Andrew and Zilke, you are particularly um, able to speak to this. Zilke, I know that you've had the experience of shutting things shutting down when one tries to bring into the discussion uh, things that, that perhaps the, the listening audience is not used to. And you've also had the particular problem of translation when you go between science and um, non-scientists, I mean, so STS scholars operating in these institutions. Andrew, my feeling is that you've cultivated well, I don't know. I mean, is it the case that you've cultivated the critical stance more inside your academic work than in direct interaction with the institutions uh, that you navigate? But Pat and Ben, I know that you're constantly in conversation with places that you want to reform and, and people that you want to reform. So the question of translation, um, you know, when does the reformer get irritating like too much of a gadfly <laughs> you know uh, and and how how does one maintain the balance between friendly critic and and somebody who actually opens people's eyes to something they haven't seen so you know the the making and language thing and the um, balancing critique with playing the insider game in a sense those are two themes that i thought i heard running through all of your talks and i'd love to hear you say more about those things in any order should we start from my left andrew yeah sure so uh, thank you um to all of the panel for your provocative talks, um, incredibly rich. So let me pick up just a couple of things from what you've said, Sheila. So you started off with the theme of making, and then also the question of the reception of our ideas. Okay, so let me put those two things together in the notion of the prototype. So um, 
Maybe I can come at it indirectly. So you would know possibly that Fleur Johns has, you know, a few years ago introduced this notion of kind of governing pro prototype, which she sets in relation to governing as planning, right? So prototyping being informed by the uh, experimental um, ethic of the maker movement. So this, so this is a world in which governance experiments policies are produced um, as yeah, through this spirit of experimenters and prototyping and so on. And it strikes me that this is a way of making which is very deliberately designed to make with a view to unmaking or with a view to provoking um, a spirit of reception which is creative and unmakes what you make. And I do wonder, um, and so, uh, uh, so, so this seems to me to be important. It seems to me to be part of what I was trying to get at in relation to this governance vision and Pulse Lab. And there's, uh, you know, you, you, making and language you posited. I mean, I think there's, there's ways in which in the international realm, um, certain discursive moves, certain linguistic constructs, in a really mundane sense, have that empty quality, right? Just simply because they are they are there to bridge differences in a really mundane way. And so there's a whole bunch of very, very well-established techniques for producing those kinds of discursive constructs, which can work in a variety of ways, but potentially can be adopted by this sort of ethic and sent out there, right? Um, so, so, I, so I think, so it seems to me that, um, yeah, I mean, so, so that's one answer to the question of, that's one answer to the question of reception and the question of audience is to engage in the, sp is in the spirit of prototyping to help to construct objects, whether they're material, discursive, or some combination of them, which one then sends out and, and, and offers purely as a prototype to be, to be, um, to be reconstructed, discarded, whatever, you know, but, yeah. Can you give just a quick example of a prototype that you are happy to have made that did the job that you're describing? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think um, even in my car, so that's interesting. So a prototype that I'm happy to have made, maybe, maybe I can be a little more humble um, and, um, <laughs> I think even in the context of the project that I'm working on now, in which one has, yeah, one has very distinctive um, prototype regulatory partnerships in the form or in sort of memorandum of understanding, soft regulatory partnerships built on deferential uh, relationships. These are very much in the process of prototyping and experimentation and in, uh, an object in search of a strategy in a way or in search of a larger vision. And I see that at work in a lot of different spaces, whether it's fin you know, financial you know, regulation, in sandboxes, in innovation sandboxes, energy sandboxes, and also other areas. So I think maybe that's one example. Great, Patricia? Um, I, uh, I'm really concerned about the way in which contract has a discourse that we don't spend a great deal of time analyzing actually as a discourse that is quite distinct from that of constitutional discourse. And uh, when you put an object or a being in the language of contract, it completely transforms what it is. And so the example that comes to mind, and I'm searching for one that's more technologically based, but let me give you this one, is um, the case of a man named John Wood who lost his leg in a in a, in, a, in a plane accident, and it was amputated, but he wanted to keep it because for religious reasons he wanted to be buried with his body whole. It had symbolized something to him. But he fell on hard times, he became homeless, he put the leg in a storage locker um, and forgot about it. <laughs> and the contents were sold on one of those television programs that we have in the United States, Storage Wars or whatever, and people bid <laughs> for the contents, and it was found. <laughs> wrapped and lying in a smoker. And so the, the, it was purchased by a man named Shannon Wisnant, who purchased it, took it to the police to see whether or not this object was actually the evidentiary, uh, the evidence, the forensic evidence of a crime. It was not, um, John Wood was found, or the story, but, but he, he, you know, John Wood wanted his leg back. Um, and Shannon Wisnant decided that it was a commodity, it was the product of a contract, <laughs> 
for fair value, purchased in good faith, and that it had a commodity value that he was going to exploit in hanging it in, an, in, in a Halloween exhibit and charging for its admission. I'm sorry, this is a very American story, <laughs> only in America. <laughs> it's starkly gothic. <laughs> but nevertheless, that leg, that leg changed, changed in its substance, in its entire referential system, when one viewed it as an arm's length transaction for value in a commodity market. Um, and when you took it out of that sphere and made it the extension of a human being as a constitutional subject, it became much more of or sort of exposes, I think, the religious resonance of what we mean by constitutional. Um, and it might even be owed something like funerary respect, regard. Um, it is a cipher for the human being, which is priceless, which is beyond price, um, and which can't be, ex or generally we have a set of protections against simply partializing the body in that sense. Um, and so this was a tension between those two moral universes. Um, and it seems to me that the way in which that language of contract as opposed to constitution, um, um, of the body and bodily integrity versus anything's for sale, um, really is an example of the way in which the language isn't just different, the thing becomes different, it becomes thingified in contract as opposed to humanized in a constitutional reference system. Mm. Great. Silke? So in, in my experience, when it comes to global environment politics, it's very interesting to understand how new numerical language was generated, how to translate local information about snowfall heats into a global currency. And it was a lot of effort to create this language that every model understands, but which is interchangeable between different countries, between different weather offices and things like that. And what happens when um, local information or local knowledge is translated into this global stuff? And when it comes to policy making, this numerical language is quite useful because it helps to um, depoliticize um, policy, policy making, as the political scientist Peter M. Haas calls it, it keeps problems from the political world. And our job often is um, to, to um, make the point that these are products of international negotiation processes where there are a lot of politics, different positions when it comes to whatever fuels and things like that, very toxic topics. And at the end, we have, we could put it friendly, least common denominator solution, very abstract um, boundary objects. And um, one could also say at some points, these are boundary objects or empty signifiers because <laughs> they say that the targets are visible, but at the end of the day, they mean very different things to different people. And it seems to me that STS scholars or um, people from humanity are bringing in or um, retranslating sense into these um, numerical languages because when it comes to climate science, it's very important that it's neutral, not prescriptive. And this means that at the global level, you can wash out questions of responsibility, who was causing the problem, but also the very toxic question, who wins, who loses, who will be concerned. Also the question of vulnerability, which country, which group has the capacities to respond. And this masking or washing out all political topics is one part of the success stories to come to international agreements. But on the other side of the token sense, what people care about, narratives, every sense-making dimension is washed out. And our job often is to translate what does it mean in terms of what are political implications, what are um, the appropriate forms of governance, and when it comes to emerging markets for whatever negative emission technologies, nobody has an idea what kind of governance we are buying in. Mm -hmm. And I guess um, we are also part of this translation 
vision game and re bringing in sense and politics in a very abstract formalistic world. Ben? How am I supposed to go after those <laughs> three comments? Well, uh, so, Sheila, to come back to your, your sort of two questions, I mean, what you said about, you know, um, the WTO or whatever it was is the place where ideas go to die. There's no, <laughs> there's no poetry there. Um, or, I mean, it actually strikes me as a sort of interesting place to see a kind of a paradox, which, I mean, in, in a sense, there is no poetry. There's no aspiration to poeticism, but there is a kind of project of poesis that's at work in all of, in, in what everybody on the, in the symposium has talked about. Um, you know, a project of, of creative making and in the little bit where I was talking about secularity, I think that the sort of project of secular poesis, where the, the power to make somehow comes along with the notion of the authorization to make, um, which comes with the, a sort of sense of, of, you know, the creator power. I mean, a sense of, of, of dominion um, and you know, to me, the, the problem of sort of poesis without poetry maybe is a pretty good way of capturing the technological predicament that, that um, Pat ended with, you know? I mean, the, the wall as an utterly unpoetic making um, that is somehow tragic in spite of itself. Um, and... You know, I, I, I guess my sort of conception, maybe a simple-minded conception of politics is, my, it's mine, not, I was going to say, it's an Arendtian conception of politics. Hers is not simple-minded, mine is. But, but you know, Arendt, Hannah Arendt says, um, speech is what makes man a political being. Um, and it seems to me that the problem of speech um, over against the project of making sort of captures the challenge of, of politics of our moment, right? Because the forms of speech that we seem to be progressively more committed to, which are facilitated by those technological modalities that we increasingly use to speak and ask to speak us, um, is, a, is fast speech, is quick speech, is short speech, is impatient speech. And you know, a, a sort of politics that's grounded in speech requires listening and it requires patience and it's nonlinear and it's, and it's uh, apophatic, to use a sort of theological term. It orients itself towards aspirations that at the same time, you know, accepts that it never arrives at because they are essentially contested. Um, and, and to me, you know, that also is the challenge of intervention. Um, and so, God, I have no idea how to answer your second question. Um, really, I don't even know why some of the people that I find myself talking to in the course of my research will continue to talk to me because, <laughs> because I know I get pretty irritating. Uh, and, yet, and yet, there is something that's, in my experience, kind of powerful about the moment in which, um, you know, one, if one sort of articulates that basic aspiration to living well together, to, you know, a kind of Arendtian politics. Who can say no? And yet in a funny way, all of these projects of making are militating against that project, even though somehow that's supposed to sit beneath or back of um, all of these projects are, of making. What to do about that? I mean, I suppose keep talking, right? Um, and, en and engage others in, in the forms of talk that require one to, to slow down, to contend with ideas the way one, I suppose, encounters poetry, which is always slowly. Um, but anyway, those are that. <laughs> thanks. Thanks a lot for those, uh, for those uh, replies to Sheila's very uh, <laughs> difficult question about the relations between language and making. Uh, and I would just like to pick up on your, your last point, Ben, about speed, because I, I noticed in, in all your presentations, speed or pace or the intensification of the tempos that you describe for the very complex systems that you work with 
has in a sense increased. I mean, in, in, in Silke's presentation, there is, there is the discourse, of course, in the UN bodies about we don't have time and there is, there is, a, there is a time as a scarce resource, yeah? and then there is a speeding up. In, um, in Andrew's uh, description of the necessity of sensory architecture and the uh, governance by dashboard, in a sense, also speed is, is, is an integral part. And of course, in Patricia's uh, description of the um, increased speed with which our digital selves and perhaps also our bodies, as in your examples, are, are our mind increasingly rapidly, in a sense. Um, and, uh, and Ben, you also talked about the um, differentiation uh, of the speeds or tempos of, of, um, of, uh, of science and society, in a sense, which have perhaps always been there, but, but now there is a, an, an, an increased um, or a disjuncture that's perhaps more radical than, than before. So I was wondering, I mean, Paulo Virilio talked about, uh, about speed being the, the enemy of democracy, in a sense, and, and, uh, and you all point to speed being an important factor, but what can we, as experts, as expertise, engage that, that, kind, of, uh, that kind of problem? Does anyone, would like to, does anyone want to start? Sheila, would you like to offer a comment first? Well. I mean, one has to begin by asking, uh, is one talking about speed in a realist register? And, um, and to what extent the, the imaginary of speed is advanced in place of the actuality of speed? Um, so the scientists are con continually promising enormous amounts of speed. I mean, we'll, we'll have this thing tomorrow, the day after. And historians of science have made a lot of fun out of pointing out that there are these discoveries that are always 50 years away, no matter <laughs> where one is, and could have been 50 years away 100 years back or, or whatever. Um, there are other things that happen quite fast. So, for instance, the monocropping or monoculturing of certain major crops that are genetically modified happened within the span of a decade in various countries. So there are things that happen fast. One wants a Kahneman who would talk about acting fast and acting slow as a political maneuver and not as if it is a matter of the content of one's individual brain, uh, because I think then it becomes a question why, for instance, in America, we are unable to put a bullet train between uh, Boston and Washington, um, and yet you can go from Beijing to Shanghai in you know, a matter of what feels like minutes. Uh, uh, so, you know, what is it? I mean, it could be that, the, that one country is just smarter than another, but, <laughs> but, you know, probably that is not an explanation we want to settle on. So, so how is it that speed gets constructed, and, and what is it that makes the rails smooth or not? Um, that, I think, takes us into the domain of political economy, and, and you know, speed is often, I mean, talking about speed in an overly realist way, uh, I think, washes out the politics of speed. So that would be, I think, an STS 101 kind of um, thing to, to address and of course a different point is that you know who gets to have the speed <laughs> one of my favorite stories about speed is a nuclear scientist i know who um you know is extremely he's an engineer he's or he's a geologist i think anyway very down-to-earth person you know um and in a down-to-earth field and he picked me up to give me a ride once to the place where I was giving a talk, and he came in this perfect jewel box-like car that made me feel that I was stepping into an Italian manufactured jewel box. <laughs> and it was just so incongruous, you know, that I had to ask him, you know, where did he, <laughs> how did he come to have this car? It had barely any back seat, and it was, you know, just beautifully made. And he described how he had. Um, uh, 
fooled his university in a way by uh, going to a lawyer about a medical malpractice-ish thing that had happened to him in this university. He learned that it was because they had put him in the clinic where the students were experimenting. Talk about experimental objects. <laughs> the lawyer said, I could represent you, but it had cost you a lot of money. He said, well, what would I have to do? And the lawyer gave him some instructions on the spot for free. He thereupon wrote up the letter to his university, and his university immediately paid him off. Um, <laughs> which was a speedy thing to happen <laughs> in this contractual world in some sense. Anyway, his wife had bet with him that if he got any money, he could have the car of his choice. <laughs> and so he <laughs> bought the car of his choice, and the first day he took it out, this was in a Midwestern flat state, and he quickly rose to 170 miles an hour. And the blue lights came flashing, <laughs> and he uh, was given a ticket, but he explained this entire story, <laughs> and he got away with a 10-mile-an-hour excess speeding ticket instead of a 120-mile-an-hour excess speeding <laughs> ticket. So, you know, in, in a sense, that story has in it the ingredients of everything that all four of you have talked about. <laughs> I mean, it certainly has multiple discourses. It has different schemes of law bumping up against one another. You know, was it tort law or was it something else? It has objects that are prototypes, <laughs> and it is about the constructiveness of speed. Mm -hmm. so, so, you know, I think I always hear this language of how life is speeding up and we're going faster and faster with many, you know, sort of skeptical senses rising all over my skin. Patricia? Uh, it, it, the... Um I think that the question of speed, and particularly as Paul Virilio describes it, really comes from, again, a contractary notion at, at, at heart, and, and it's useful to think of that speed as something which is viewed as cumbersome, that which can be shed, that which is in conflict with the efficiencies of a marketplace, and that's what's meant by speed. And so I think of contract as something as in, in its current form, in its American and therefore globally influential um, manifestations in the world of technology um, as a device of reading, a con of reading you know, meaning in a very literal way, not poetic way, no play with words, but very literal, so that you can dispense with outside interpretations. It's located simply between the parties to the contract. Other people's opinions don't matter. It was this mode of reading is not just Puritan fundamentalism, it's also was developed at a time to, to, to um, advance the Industrial Revolution, to make transactions less costly with fewer remedial um, uh, obstacles. And that seems to me increasingly the dominant discourse in a way that affects our language in everything. Every, we all speak contract speak in the United States at any rate at this point. And one of the features of constitutional discourse is a hesitancy, literally a, you know, a, a, a tendency to think about what could be, what should be. It's, constitutional is the realm of a different moral universe that is, you know, that in, it, in its ideal sense, I think of, and maybe I'm going out on a limb here, but I think of as the realm of the subjunctive. Mm -hmm. You know, that it really does give us pause. It allows us to imagine something. It, you know, it, 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 there's, there's a sense of hesitation um, before one commits. And I think it's not accidental that over time, American diction and discourse has lost the subjunctive. You know, we don't say, if I were a carpenter anymore, we say, if I was a carpenter. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that sense of mission accomplished, mm -hmm. it was, it is, and it will be, mm -hmm. is very much a product of this kind of referential system mm -hmm. that locks out, you know, even the notion of secular poesis, because <laughs> there is no play with the words. And that's what makes it efficient and ultimately you know, we lodge, we, we, lodge, we lodge that in our brains as a kind of speed, um, even, if, even as it's mm. heavy with the chains of unconsidered consequence. <laughs> Very good. Andrew? Can I, yeah, so, um, so thank you. Uh, fabulous responses. So for me, can I say, when you talked about speed, I think 
It was helpful for me, so this is because it connects to a question that in a sense I wanted to pose to everyone, but this can be rhetorical. Um, so for me, speed has, in the context that I think about it around governance um, and imaginaries of governance, has two elements. One is, is of, a, of a world in flow, <laughs> a constantly dynamic, a, a dynamic world, incessant change. So that's one. And the other side of it is rapid response to incessant change. So there's those two things. And, you know, so for me that really does raise the question of what sort of knowledge artifacts are produced in that world, a world which is constantly changing. Because knowledge artifacts can only ever produced, be produced in that moment for that moment. And, you know, what authority do they have? What does, and, and in particular, what does hubris mean when you are producing through the technologies that we know, nothing more than pattern recognition or something else which is only potentially relevant or useful for a purpose or for a particular moment and is always through machine learning redoing itself. So I, for me, it is because the hubris of expertise is common to all of us uh, you know, as, a, as an object of our attention and criticism. But it seems to me that everything that we've talked about is has hubris, but also at the same time has a very particular kind of hubris in this world in which knowledge artifacts take that form. I mean, everything, sorry, now I'm going, I'm going on, but every example we've talked about is, every expert practice or claim to scientific authority that we've talked about is a kind of hubristic claim, but it's also a pushback against hubris at the same time. You know, so the so the, in the American world of um, COVID and so on, yield to the, so you must, so of course, let's yield to the science is yes, you must take, you must take as given my, my version of the truth. But it's an enactment of a yielding. I mean, it really is. <coughs> there's, a, there's, a self, there's a profession of just, I'm yielding to something else here. And the pushback against it is, I don't like your hubris, and I'm going to perform the pushback as a way of enacting my, you know, so I think there's always an element of something other than hubris at the same time. And I wondered how that, how we account for that in all of our um, stories that we tell. Does anyone want to respond to, to Andrew's question? But that wasn't to hijack the discussion of speed. I mean, <coughs> no, no, we're, no, we're that's there. fine. Yeah, yeah. Or should we, as we promised for several hours, open up for some questions <laughs> from, the, from the audience? So I think we, we will try to do that. <coughs> uh, does anyone like to pose a question? We have two volunteers, one on each side with, uh, with microphones. Yes, I see a question to my right first and then a question to the left afterwards. Thanks a lot for some very intriguing uh, interpretations of what is going on. I have a question about power and the uh, guiding metaphors in this uh, huge uh, science society field. There are some very powerful metaphors, so to speak, dominating and marginalizing other ways of talking about uh, issues. Some of them have been presented here, like this data points, for example, other, which are very prevalent, and the COVID has presented some of them. But what is striking is that there's a new kind of power and self-confidence on, on behalf of these metaphors, so to speak, in spite of that there are many other alternatives present in the public debate. There's no lack of alternatives, alternative metaphors. Still, that metaphor is dominating. Also, it doesn't really seem to undermine the metaphor that it's basically very unclear, very diffuse, and nobody really understands what it's all about. Still, the power is there. And it doesn't really seem to undermine the power of the metaphor that a host of people in the scientific, the relevant scientific communities themselves do not really buy into them. And they are penetrating in a new way that they haven't really seen before in a differentiated society. Yeah, it's a question about that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Does anyone uh, like to respond? I ha Patricia? I have uh, that calls to mind, and it might also be a, a sort of dovetail with, with, yes. with the last uh, question as well. 
um, that in the expression of our hubris <laughs> in the, and, and in the assertion of our power, there's almost always a, uh, a sort of imaginary um, golem um, of heroicism for which people are simultaneously laying down their lives. <laughs> um, and so I'm thinking of the quite um, problematic way in which uh, uh, in the United States, you know, the, the access to reproductive technology or not um, is being expressed around a model of the eternal innocent preborn child or the fetal, you know, fetal personhood in a way that is idealized and sacralized in a way that no human being could actually ever. I mean, all of that stops the moment the child is born into the filthy world. <laughs> but, um, or, or in fact, when in our, you know, the, the, the degree to which our um, public health response to the COVID crisis was so consistently derailed, um, it was by phrases like, I'd rather, you know, die than, uh, than see the economy killed. Um, and so the economy became that for which people lay down their lives. I, when, I was, when I saw um, Ben's um, uh, picture of demonstrators um, who, 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 who were so committed in this fervent sense, it seems to me there's, there's always some depiction of innocence and evil. Um, however, I might find that sort of fantastical. It's a powerful fantasy that, um, that negotiates power and hubris and commitment, and commitment rooted in a kind of sense of sacrificial self. Thanks. Silke, uh, Ben, would you like to respond as well? Or? No. Go ahead. No, no, up <laughs> to you. No. I don't have anything very intelligent to say. Um, <laughs> I don't have anything very intelligent to say other than that when you were asking your question, I was thinking about the, you know, sort of Pat's materialized metaphor, the, the CRISPR-Cas9 mm. system and this sort of, um, I mean, well, what did you say? It passed around and worshipped like a religious totem. <laughs> um, we were stroking it and, <laughs> like yeah. a little animal, like a furry bunny. <laughs> and, and it's true. I mean, I'd forgotten about that, but the, the red, white, and blue. You were um, there. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. You know, I, I mean, I think the um, the ways in which the the ways in which metaphors carry the sorts of veneration and the sorts of I mean, I guess the right word is theologies that the sort of tacit theologies that Pat you're uh, articulating seems to me you know worth seeing um, this the sacralization, the term sacralization has been used various times in, in various um, presentations, but you know, I mean, it's sort of disenchanted sacralization and the disenchantment sort of overrides the recognition of sacralization and, and the ways in which the metaphor carries the sacred. Um, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think that uh, that's, th that a, the attunement to those sorts of dynamics is something that somehow um, has come to be attenuated with the rise of these dynamics themselves. But they, but those, but these dynamics live inside of these things, even if, even if uh, they they're born by these things, even if um, you know, in our literalism, we you know sort of fail to see their metaphoric power. We have another question, uh, Luke. Could you, could you, I forgot it the, for the first the gentleman who asked the question, but could you state your name first? Uh, yes, uh, Luke Bretherton. Um, thank you for a really, really rich set of presentations. I've got kind of pages of notes, and the two, kind of two inter interrelated questions born out of uh, what seems to me some kind of a theme running through them. And the kind of background for this is, is debates we're having at, at my university at, at Duke in, in North Carolina. And it seems to be one of, in, in as much as there was a deconstruction of certain kind of lines like fact, value, uh, kind of knowledge, norm, there was one that was set up running through between kind of hubris and humility. 
which I think is very valuable and, and important. Hubris, obviously, a kind of classical vice and, and humility, a, a kind of Christian virtue. I'm just wondering, and, and the background to this question is really in my, my university, we're very, very good at training technocrats. That's what we do. And, and people pay a lot of money to come and be trained and be credentialed and have certain kind of credentialed knowledge to then go out and earn lots of money to, to do that kind of thing. Uh, but, but there's a kind of recognition on behalf of the university that questions of character and virtue are entirely absent from the formation. And we had an interesting conversation with the um, uh, dean of the engineering school who, who suddenly realized he was kind of terrified that he was training these people who were writing the algorithms of the future, whether it was in fintech or driverless cars. And they were, their idea was to leave it all up to the compliance committee at the end of the process to decide <laughs> whether it was ethical or not. And he thought, I think we should be asking them some questions in their training and formation about <laughs> character and virtue. But the cupboard's empty. We, I, have no, I have no way of asking those questions or knowing how to train people to do that. Um, and so I just, I'm kind of interested in your own reflections you know, as, as a panel about how questions of character are raised in science and technology studies. Because it seems to me all the questions you're raising can't really be addressed through policy or regulatory regimes. They're, they're partly about how we how we formed as characters. And related to that, I think very powerfully you've communicated how in processes of the co-production of knowledge, questions of meaning and purpose are being a, are tacitly at work running through them, but how they're often denied. We're, we're not really asking kind of teleological questions about the meaning and purpose of human life when in fact that's exactly what's driving so much of the development of science and technology and the regulatory regimes around it. And that's what's at work in those models. And I just, and again, in, in my university, we're having this big debate about how do we address climate change, but there's always this allergy to asking explicitly questions of meaning and purpose. What is the meaning and purpose of the economy, of a university, of this kind of science? And I just wonder how you think about questions of meaning and purpose and how, how to kind of raise them as subjects of kind of democratic deliberation uh, in the context of science and technology studies. Thanks a lot. Ben and Silke afterwards. So uh, thanks for the question and I could go on and on and on and on about <laughs> it, but let me say two really simple things. First of all, those questions of meaning and purpose are there. They're just not explicitly articulated there there the commitments exist the ambivalences about the commitments exist in a sense in a sense there's a but in a sense it's sort of bad manners it's like not civically virtuous to express ambivalence to articulate meaning and purpose to acknowledge commitment so the ways in which it gets sort of structurally built in and yet unquestioned and it should be structurally built in but it should be questioned and it's the questioning that should be str I mean that it, it seems to me that that's where that's the rub um, and one of the big problems has been you know the notion that we need you know engineering ethics that we need ethics that is that is the handmaiden of the project of innovation when you know I mean if the project of innovation is about is about you know human well-being about progress purpose and the good shouldn't innovation be the servant of ethics but that requires a quite radical reconception of well of the project of knowledge itself and its organization in the university and in other sorts of social and political institutions and and so on and so forth i mean and in a sense the kind of hesitation that that way of thinking would require is the, is the hesitation of a sort of constitutional discourse as Pat was articulating it and, you know, the sort of efficiency of a kind of literalist, linear, get the job done is, is what's inimical to that. Um, so I think that just saying more ethics, it's pretty meaningless. We say it a lot, we invest quite a lot in it. It's, it ends up being a kind of window dressing. Would you agree with that, Silke? Uh, 
yeah, more or less. So in, in my experience, um, I, I was working in a field of climate science, environmental science for over 20 years now, and social science have always been at the end of pipe position. So we have whatever modeling, economics, and then some communication or acceptance scientists translating the difficult message for the public. And um, so I guess this is very stable. But, but then, um, um, time after time, there was also an awareness that something is missing. And the question is how to fill or how to address these kind of demands for more than numerical knowledge, more than science, and how to bring in um, alternative expertise, um, humanities, social science, and so on. And how it's not only bringing social scientists to the table, but also um, to give them a voice and also um, have something like a constitutional discourse where you can also challenge the language, the frameworks in which science is conducted. And if you are able to shape and not take for granted that natural science um, say this is science and you have to do it in this way, but also contribute to shape this kind of constitutional discourses, then it would be a very important step to give social sciences a voice and, and also reframe question at the very beginning of research processes or political processes. But this is a very idealistic mm. picture of the mm. whole thing. Thanks. Andrew? Yeah, maybe, uh, just to say a few quick words. So one, just quickly to hark back to the previous questioner and just to say, um, so this notion of the metaphor, its power notwithstanding its kind of obvious fictionality or the fact that not everyone buys into it and so on, and the notion of disenchanted sacrali sacralization. Yeah, ju just to say, I think that rightly and squarely poses the question of how practices of irony and disenchantment are involved in stabilizing objects, not destabilizing them now. Like, I think that's a really important question around expertise. Um, and then on the question of character, yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to add, except just to say that, uh, you know, maybe two quick things. The adulation of Dr. Fauci, isn't it, isn't it all aesthetic and character and him as a person and his humility and his humble, and, you know, and, and just the way he conducts himself, right? So, in, so here, Science is the character embodied by Fauci. So I sort of see character everywhere in that yielding to science. Um, it's a very specific aesthetic of, uh, of, of moral virtues. Um, and then I guess the other thing to say, the other thing I wanted to say around humility and the conduct of expertise is, or and the, the hidden ways in which, in which large collective questions are uh, resolved or, or you know, somehow implicitly resolved. You know, there's, you know, one, res I mean, we need to always bear in mind one response is, okay, let's excavate them and subject them to public reason. But another response is to produce forms of knowledge which are just sitting there alongside others and which can be, which are deliberately designed in ways which can be attached to and disattached from, detached from different political projects, right? So that's another way of, of expressing humility, just to say, we can't ever agree. I, I'm not, by the way, saying this is the right way forward. I'm saying we need to be aware that if that critique leads to a number of different kinds of responses, a full public reason, a larger process of collective formation is one, but it can go in a very different direction. Um, yeah. Thanks a lot. Sheila. <laughs> Um, so, Luke, in answer to your question, I think the first thing that one would have to say is that whatever uh, strategy you pick, it has to be to some extent aware of the civic epistemology of the culture that you're in and you yourself have worked in too, that though they have the same language, operate very differently in terms of what a persuasive argument is. And uh, So recently I was commissioned to write an essay on humility, because I wrote this essay about 20 years ago called Technologies of Humility, and lots of people have read it and misunderstood it and <laughs> nevertheless use it. Um, but this was for Boston Review, which is one of these intellectual magazines, and, and I 
wrote the essay they wanted me to, I made it absolutely clear in the plainest of plain English that I was not talking about humility as the stance of an individual in relation to something, but that it was a, you know, a, an intersubjective position uh, and that it was about cultivating the practices of humility and not the mental attitude. And then they had four correspondence, I mean, people who wrote comments, and each and every one of them accused me of, of having gone astray. One of them actually said, now is not the time for humility, it's full steam ahead. I mean, so this is post-COVID learning, mind you. I mean, you know, so they're, they're, you know, full steam ahead doing what? The same thing America did during the first phase of COVID? But, but it was like, it was an allergen. This is a country in which the allergen menu is as big as the menu in <laughs> many restaurants. So, so I have to figure out something about Norway and allergens. But, <laughs> but this is a puzzle of fieldwork that has come to me <laughs> during this trip. But it's like the word humility causes Americans to go into a serious tailspin. And you know, when I was looking at that image of Pats, which is very evocative, and I was thinking of the creator power that Ben was talking about. I was wondering, you know, the, put an American scientist in front of that, and they would say, there's nothing tragic about this. We can use CRISPR to make that bird fly, and we can probably <laughs> use information technology to put chips into anybody who's trying to cross over, maybe even get rid of the wall, and instead have one of these sensory devices, and <laughs> so the people wouldn't be able to cross, but the bird would be able to fly. I mean, you know, there's nothing impossible in the world. You can, you can be a can-do person and cure it. So bring me your tired, you're poor, and, you know, I will crisper them. <laughs> <laughs> and we, Ben and I were in a panel in which that was actually said. The man came out of Jennifer Doudna's shop, she is one of the Nobel laureates for CRISPR technology, and he said, you know, we're minutes away, we can, we can engineer people to sleep less. So there's your tired, they won't be tired anymore because they will only need four hours of sleep a night. And, and he really seemed to think that this invention was truly round the corner and all he had to do was, was uh, subject the world to it. So, so uh, you know, talk about, I mean, where is power in that? I mean, it's the way that the I mean, I think it goes back, Pat, to your point about subjunctive, right? I mean, I, that they, they're, it's always in the ears. I mean, so the, the, and the technology works because it's in the ears domain. You can, you can mm. change this gene and you can get the four hours of sleeping. And, you know. <laughs> Thank you very much. We have uh, one more question in the back. Uh, if, yes, if you can be quick. Thank you very much, Tere Kritsenko, University of Helsinki. Um, thank you very much for this really wonderful, spectacular morning. I will keep my question very short. I want to ask you about uncertainty. So I think uh, Professor Jasenov's work shows very nicely how, let's say from 1970s up until today, uh, there has been this um, constitution of the regimes of certainty to deem our world and our future knowable, predictable, forecastable, and hence governable. But in the last decades, it all cracks, it all falls together, everything becomes, feels so uncertain. We are making even more effort to make things certain and predictable. We are putting even more money into artificial intelligence, into big data, into models, and yet we are failing and failing again. And I feel like in the line of scholarship that I'm following, uh, governance and decision science, there is a lot of convergence on uh, a notion of um, precaution as the way to deal with uh, uncertainty, to embrace uncertainty and to act upon uncertainty. I'm very interested because many of you, I think the word uncertainty has not been said so many times today, but it was somehow very much in the air. So I want to uh, reflect from your positions very briefly on what should we do about this uncertainty that seems to be looming from all the corners and our general um, kind of regimes of certainty that we are so 
much trying to, in, in a political sense, I mean, trying to preserve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anyone want to tackle looming uncertainty? Well, I will at least plead an excuse because the title of the talk I'm giving after lunch is Democracy in an Unknowable World, and I did toy with whether to say uncertain, and I specifically didn't put uncertain. So, <laughs> so since I'm, I'll talk about related things, I'm not going to say anything more right now. Andrew? I mean, I'll just I'll say one word by way of preface to others, which is simply to say, you know, one, one question is how, how do we appropriately respond to an uncertain world? A another question is what work is being done by the ongoing construction of the world as radically uncertain and what forms of governance and um, risk management techniques t does that give rise? So just, just, j just slightly reframing the question as saying what the world we're in is not just a radically uncertain one, it's one in which we understand it to be uncertain, and that is understood to be the governance problem to which we respond. Um, and that's an interesting question in itself, but that's, yeah. Thank you. This is, of course, also integral to, um, to the rise of resilience governance and, and these kinds of modes mm -hmm. of governance as well. Silke, would you like to, to comment on that, having worked on sort of climate governance, in a sense, and its relation yep. to uncertainty yeah. and the how should I put it, the instrumentalization of uncertainty for certain political purposes? Um, yes, and um, this would raise the question of uncertainty and epistemic authority, because uncertainty, and we have seen it in the case of climate change, um, that uncertainties can be used in order to delay political actions. It can be used by powerful actors. But um, in an STS sense, we can also see that it's not about um, science itself, but it's often about underlying politics that people who who, whatever, don't like um, interventions into the market. They blame scientists, they, uh, um, they try to discredit the IPCC as a um, messenger of this unconvenient truth and so on. And often uncertainties are made or constructed and this is all about politics of expertise. And but I have to keep it very short, so the IPCC has done a lot in order to maintain or to be very transparent about uncertainties, to quali uh, quantify uncertainties in order to enhance or in order to stabilize its epistemic authority. And the question also, and it's also about power, who has the power um, to distinguish what, what are certain formats or forms of uncertainties and what is certain and what is uncertain. But there are other persons in the room who have worked on this more than I did. So uncertainty management is a very important topic there. Anyone else? Sheila is excused since you're going to talk about this <laughs> later on. But anyone else? Ben, Patricia? Yeah, I mean, I guess I would say that it seems to me important whether we think of uncertainty as an epistemological condition, and therefore it requires the sort of provisionality in the moment that one adopts in response to, to uh, the, the in-principle possibility of certitude, but the recognition of it's not yet. Um, and the ways in which that not yet has a kind of teleology built into it. it things are getting better all the time. You know, s uncertainty diminishes even as, even as in sort of reflexive modernity it looms ever larger. Um, I, I guess I, I would want to say that, you know, without having thought very carefully about this, you know, if we, draw, if we think certainty and uncertainty is the dyad well, that put, it puts us in that kind of epistemological box to begin with. If we think of certitude and something else, I, I think I would say ambivalence as the dyad, it puts us somewhere else. Um, and, you know, I think the ways in which the sort of politics of contending with uncertainty are inflected with the notion that we need politics because we have uncertainty, and if we didn't, we wouldn't, um, is worth worrying over a bit. I agree. Patricia. Uh, 
I, I have really nothing to add to that other than you know the, what echoes in my mind every time I hear the word uncertainty is securitization. I mean, it's the rush from mm -hmm. uncertainty to securitization and more of some um, particularly limiting, honeycombing, dividing, wall building conceptually and otherwise. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sheila, would you like to say anything as a way of closing or should we just close? I mean, the time is running up. Well, I think one thing that hasn't been said is uh, gratitude to you for uh, <laughs> moderating this uh, uh, event, but that's only such a tiny part of the entire act of conceptualizing and orchestrating uh, these um, the series of events and so I want to make sure that in front of an audience of witnesses I get to thank you, thank you for, for <laughs> even if thank you're even if you're working me way too hard and I should uh, demand <laughs> union wages <laughs> But you're Thank paying me more than union wages, so, <laughs> so I can't demand anything. Uh, anyway, so, so thank you for that. And, and, you know, these are ongoing conversations, and, you know, we, uh, various of us are already in conversation with various of you in the audience, but, but I hope that the, the sort of generative power of the network is, uh, is something that, you know, causes new friendships to happen over lunch and so on and so forth, and... and that's mostly my hope. Thanks a lot for that uh, 2022 Holberg Laureate Sheila Josanoff. And being an anthropologist, I would like to reciprocate by thanking you as well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and uh, particularly Silke and Andrew and Ben and Patricia and everyone in the audience who has made this into a very illuminating and exciting symposium. I still have a number of questions that we could have talked about, but our time is up, so we will have to end it here. Now, in the Ola, there will be served lunch, which is in the back. But at 2 o'clock sharp, the 2022 Holberg laureate Sheila Jasanov will give the Holberg lecture in this Ola, which should not be missed. So welcome back then, and thank you again, all of you.